13-year-old Bradley Hansen left his home on November 10th, 1995, without telling his mother that school had been canceled. Instead, he snuck over to a friend's home and never returned. When trash collectors visited the area later on to empty the bins, workers noticed some concerning evidence inside one of the neighborhood trash cans. But unfortunately, this small amount of evidence wasn't enough to lead to a conviction, at least not yet. But when investigators finally revealed their primary suspect, Bradley's family was shocked because the crime hit much closer to home than any of them could have expected. Bradley Hansen was your average teenage boy growing up in the mid-90s. Being 13, he had just reached the age where he was starting to become interested in finding a girlfriend, and there were plenty of girls his age at his school in Phoenix, Arizona. Bradley was enrolled at Centennial Middle School in Phoenix, where he'd established a core group of friends that he felt he could depend on. One of his closest friends was a kid named Jeremy Bach, and Jeremy and Bradley were pretty much inseparable. The two would often hang out before school started, and they were the first two kids to meet up after school had ended, too. It was November of 1995. Brad and Jeremy were speaking sometime earlier that month about Veterans Day, a popular holiday here in the United States. Knowing that the two would be off of school for the holiday, they'd been excitedly planning on what they could do with all their free time. But the crazy thing is, Brad's mother didn't even realize that the children would be out of school for the holiday and Brad had no plans of telling her. We don't know if he kept this information a secret from his mother because he feared that she may interfere with his plans or if he simply didn't realize that his mother was unaware of the holiday. But whatever the case was, Brad and Jeremy had quite a day ahead of them. When Veterans Day finally rolled around, it was November 10th and Brad woke up that morning, got dressed and prepared for the day as it were any other. He then hopped on a bike that he had borrowed from his neighbor and headed off in the direction of the school. His mother watched him leave and, obviously believing it was a school day, didn't think much else about the situation. But as we know, Brad had no plans of going to school that day. Somewhere along the way, Brad changed course and began heading toward his friend Jeremy's house. It's believed that one of the reasons why Brad was so excited about his plans that day was because a girl named Taylor was expected to show up at Jeremy's house later on that afternoon. Taylor was a friend from school, and if I had to guess, one or both of these boys likely had a bit of a crush on the girl. And considering everyone's parents were at work for the day, you can only imagine what must have been going through these teenagers' minds when Taylor agreed to stop by for a visit. Now, we don't know for sure what the boys had planned on getting up to while they had the entire day to themselves, but the fact that they kept their plans a secret from their parents seems to allude to the idea that they may have been getting up to no good. Now, I can't say this with any certainty, but considering what would take place just a few short hours later, well, this theory may not be as far-fetched as it seems. No sooner than Brad arrived at Jeremy's house, the two ran into Jeremy's stepdad, Daniel, in the kitchen. It seems that Jeremy's dad also didn't realize the boys were off from school for the day, as he claims he was under the impression that the boys would be heading off soon after he left at around 7 a.m. that morning. Needless to say, the boys were over the moon that they had managed to fend off their parents and claim the entire day to themselves, meaning they could do pretty much anything they wanted with no supervision. A scary thing for two teenage boys. But their plans were nearly foiled, because at around 8 a.m., Brad's mom, Rhonda, had a sudden realization that it was Veterans Day. She began paging Brad repeatedly. Mind you, this is 1995, but Brad never responded. She sent him several pages all throughout the day, but Brad simply refused to answer. Rhonda didn't get off of work until 2 p.m. that afternoon, but once she got back home, she still couldn't locate Brad. This was very much unlike him to not respond to his mother's pages and calls. While Brad was your average, reckless teenage boy, he always made sure to stay in touch with his mother, so the fact that he'd suddenly dropped off the map sent every alarm in Rhonda's head ringing. Rhonda reached out to several of her neighbors and friends and tried to determine if anyone had seen Brad that day, but no one had any idea where he may have gone. She even called several of Brad's friends and classmates, but no one reported anything. Rhonda eventually decided to call Jeremy, and that's when things got interesting. Jeremy opened up to Rhonda about what the boys had been up to that morning, but the problem was Jeremy claimed that Brad had left sometime early that morning, 
but he had no idea where he may have gone. As far as Jeremy knew, he simply hopped on his bike and left, pedaling off into the distance. Rhonda asked Jeremy that if he sees Brad, to let him know that if he's not home by 5 p.m., she'll be calling the police to file a missing person report. Jeremy agreed, and the two hung up the phone. Now, there's some unusual information about what took place immediately after this call with Jeremy. It's been reported that Rhonda decided to call Jeremy's stepfather, Daniel, who explained that he'd last seen both of the boys at 7 a.m. that morning. Daniel explained that he'd speak with Jeremy as soon as he got home, and that he would report back with any information he managed to find. But immediately after the call, Rhonda decided that she just couldn't sit around and wait for Brad to show up. She had to do something. Thus, she hopped in her car and started traveling to all of the nearby hangout spots, desperately hoping to find some trace of Brad. But she never did. And later that evening, things took a turn for the worse. Once Jeremy's stepfather, Daniel, got off of work later that evening, he spoke with Jeremy just as he said he would. But after the two spoke, for reasons that remain unclear, Daniel never bothered calling Rhonda back. He knew that Rhonda was still actively searching for her missing son, yet never bothered to pick up the phone. When police arrived to take statements from Rhonda, it seems as though they initially classified Brad's disappearance as a runaway case. They didn't know why, but they believed Brad had likely run away from home. But Rhonda didn't believe this to be true. She felt that something terrible had happened to her son and believed there was no chance he would run away like this. But it seems as though detectives were largely undeterred by her claims and pushed forward in their own way. When Brad still never returned home that night, Rhonda's fears and concerns began to grow to epic proportions. Police seem to have requested that Rhonda not go around and investigate her son's disappearance on her own, seemingly for fear of hindering their own investigation. But Rhonda didn't obey their wishes, and she went to the ends of the earth to try to find her boy. She spent the entire weekend speaking to everyone she knew that had ever met Brad, hoping someone had some sort of information, but no one did. That is, except for a couple of Brad's classmates. After Brad had disappeared, there were rumors circulating around the school that something terrible had happened to him. The rumors would suggest that a gunshot had been heard ringing out in the mid-afternoon on the day that Brad went missing. These rumors suggested that Jeremy and Brad had found a weapon inside the home that day, and Jeremy had accidentally fired a single round, which narrowly missed Brad and got lodged into the wall. But these rumors grew far more concerning when it was suggested that Brad was now in possession of the weapon, and he may have planned on using it to end his own life. Now, this may sound like a sudden and unexpected jump in the story, and it certainly is. Rather obviously, up until this point, there had been no reason for anyone to suspect that Brad would have been capable of such a thing, nor was he ever described as being depressed. This only made Rhonda and the police all the more suspicious about these rumors. But the thing is, a rumor has to start somewhere. So it's possible there may have been more truth to this story than anyone else cared to admit. Daniel, Jeremy's stepfather, would call Rhonda sometime around November 13th, about three days after Brad had gone missing. During their call, Rhonda opened up about the rumors that she had heard regarding Brad's intentions. Daniel assured Rhonda that these were nothing more than rumors, and even went as far as calling home to his girlfriend, asking her to check and make sure that all of the family's weapons were safely stored away and accounted for. When Daniel's girlfriend, Debbie, checked the safe, she confirmed everything was in order and nothing was missing. This did a lot to calm the nerves of Rhonda, but in a sense, it also made things worse because this meant that she was back to square one. This is when Jeremy decided that it was time to speak with Brad's mother personally. Jeremy called Rhonda shortly thereafter and explained everything that had transpired that day. Now, we don't know all the specifics of their call, but Jeremy said that he'd last seen Brad when he left and rode off on the bike that he borrowed from his neighbor. He added that Brad wasn't in the best of moods when he left that day. Jeremy was able to confirm that, as far as he knew, he had been the last person to have seen Brad. But he also added that in the last conversation that he had with Brad, Brad had allegedly claimed that his life, quote, sucked shortly before pedaling off on his bike. But by the following Monday, when Brad still had not been located and rumors were beginning to grow far more frequent and far more concerning, 
the school decided that it was time to get involved. This is when Anne Schelling stepped in. Anne was one of the school's lead administrators, and she spoke with Jeremy twice that day, as well as dozens of other students who had some sort of relation to Brad. Now, according to Anne, she was able to determine that Jeremy, Brad, and Taylor, the female friend who had stopped by, had all been hanging out that day. Now, prior to this, it doesn't seem as though Jeremy had ever mentioned that Taylor had been at the house that day. It seems that this information was first brought up when Anne had spoken with Taylor privately. For whatever reason, Jeremy was doing his best to keep Taylor out of the situation. But now, things had escalated. Anne decided to bring both Taylor and Jeremy into the room at the same time. And that's when Jeremy adapted his story slightly, saying that the two had last seen Brad heading off on his bike, with Brad claiming that he would return in about 10 minutes, but he never came back. This is where things get incredibly interesting, and the story that Jeremy shared with his parents and investigators, well, it began to fall apart. Jeremy knew something about where Brad had gone, but he wasn't willing to let this information slip. Realizing that Taylor and Jeremy had each been telling completely different versions of the story, Anne decided to pull Taylor aside and ask her what had really happened that day. Taylor was incredibly honest, even when she realized that her confession may get Jeremy in a lot of trouble. Taylor admitted that she had made plans with the boys to meet up at Jeremy's house that day. She added that when she arrived, she noticed Brad's bike in the driveway, a fact that didn't align with the story that Jeremy had shared, claiming Brad had already driven off on his bike. But strangely, when she entered the home, Brad was nowhere to be found. She noticed Brad's backpack sitting on the kitchen table alongside his pager, yet Brad wasn't inside the house. When Taylor asked Jeremy where Brad was, Jeremy explained that Brad had left. Taylor obviously didn't believe him. All of his things had been left behind, so where had Brad gone, and why would he leave all of his stuff? Taylor felt that Jeremy was playing some sort of a joke and believed Brad must have been hiding somewhere in the house. But after wandering all throughout the house and calling Brad's name and getting no response, Taylor finally began to believe that Jeremy was telling the truth. But no sooner than she believed him, she began to doubt him once more. That's because, as she wandered into the laundry room, she found Brad's shoes covered in red stains. After finding Brad's shoes, Taylor continued looking around the room and noticed that Brad's t-shirt was in the washing machine. It too had been stained red. But the most concerning detail was that there was a small hole in the front of the shirt. Immediately after, Taylor found a few red drips in the kitchen. When she asked Jeremy what had happened, he explained that he and Brad had gotten into an argument about her. One of the boys had called her a name, and the other boy took issue with that. A fight ensued, and Brad eventually hit Jeremy with a bar stool, causing the hole in his shirt, the red stains, and the spots on the floor. But Jeremy clearly didn't have any wounds on his body. But then, Taylor noticed a small hole in the kitchen wall. Jeremy claimed that Brad had grabbed one of the weapons from Jeremy's stepfather's cabinet and fired a single shot. Thankfully, it missed Jeremy, but it left a hole in the wall. Shortly after this is when Brad ran out of the home, claiming that he would be back soon. After Taylor revealed all of this, Anne decided to bring Jeremy back into the room. She asked him about various aspects of Taylor's story, and he finally admitted to nearly all of them. But when she asked about the hole in the kitchen wall, as well as the weapon being fired that day, he denied all of it. Jeremy claimed it was nothing more than a rumor. When Anne reached out to Daniel, Jeremy's stepfather, he stood by his son's claims and insisted that no weapons were used that day, nor was there a hole in the kitchen wall. Police would speak with Jeremy a few weeks later at his school, and Jeremy would alter his story once again, this time claiming that Brad had attacked him with a butter knife before leaving the home and never coming back. Jeremy also added that he believed Brad had run away to Arizona with a man named Poppy or that he had run away to California to find his dad. He wasn't entirely sure. But the following month, December 15th, Daniel reached out to two detectives who were working Brad's case and asked to speak with them. He explained that Jeremy had finally admitted that he and Brad were playing with the weapon on the day that Brad went missing. He claims that Jeremy came clean and admitted that a single shot had been fired that day. Jeremy even dug the slug out of the kitchen wall and held on to it all this time, with Daniel turning the slug over to investigators for further research. But my question is, if all of this is true, 
how had Daniel not noticed the hole in the wall until now? When detectives later showed up at the family's home, they asked Jeremy to reenact what had transpired the day that Brad vanished. And he claimed that the two got into an argument and Brad grabbed a weapon, firing a single round at it, which narrowly missed his shoulder. But when detectives took note of the location where Jeremy claimed all of this transpired, they realized how low the hole in the wall was, and there was no way that the slug could have narrowly missed Jeremy's shoulder. It would have gone right through him. When Jeremy was confronted with this evidence, it's reported that he slumped down a bit lower so that the hole in the wall would align more closely with his shoulder. Detectives then realized that there was something fishy going on here. About three weeks went by, and this now brings us to January of 1996. The detectives who were working the case had thought long and hard about the situation, and they no longer believed that Brad had run away. They felt that there was much more to this story than Jeremy was willing to admit. They didn't know if Jeremy was guilty of something, or if he was just covering up for his best friend, but they knew something was off. Based purely on a gut feeling, they decided to seize the family's trash can, bringing it in for forensic testing. Now, I've heard one version of the story that claims that the detectives were tipped off by local trash collectors, but other resources claim that the detectives seized the can purely off a gut feeling. I'm not sure which version of events is true, but admittedly it's largely irrelevant to the case. When detectives gained possession of the can, though, they noticed a brown pool in the bottom, as well as some brown drippage on the outside. According to detectives, they believed there was a small chance that this dried liquid may have belonged to Brad. Unfortunately, when samples were taken and compared with Brad's mother, there was a direct link between the two, meaning that whoever the evidence belonged to, they were a direct relative of Rhonda. Around this same time, Jeremy and his mother decided to uproot and move to Las Vegas. The two never explained why they had decided to do this, especially in the middle of an active investigation. But thankfully, police were able to make the proper connections with Arizona police. And they maintained contact with Jeremy, and thankfully so. Because in February of 1996, about four months after the disappearance of Brad, Jeremy decided that enough was enough. He finally opened up with detectives and confessed what had really taken place that November day. When Jeremy arrived at the police station, he quickly confessed that he and Brad had, in fact, been playing with weapons on the day that Brad was last seen. He says that they'd been playing with multiple weapons when he aimed one at Brad. When he did, he bumped his hand on something, causing him to flinch, and the weapon went off without him ever having his finger on the trigger. The slug struck Brad, but he was still alive. But what's crazy is that Jeremy had begun to panic and clean up the crime scene, leaving Brad there, desperate for help. Jeremy dug the slug out of the wall and tossed it into the trash, along with several cigarette butts that the two had been smoking earlier that day. Now, Jeremy's version of events is incredibly graphic, but based on what he told detectives, Jeremy insists that the whole situation was an accident. He claims the weapon wasn't even cocked when it went off, but this is completely impossible. According to experts, there's a distinct possibility that Brad was alive for an entire hour after the shot had rung out meaning there was more than enough time for him to have been saved. Yet, because Jeremy panicked, Brad lost his life due to sheer negligence. We don't know if Jeremy was afraid that his parents would find out that they've been playing with weapons, or if he was afraid that he may go to prison. This has never been fully explained. But regardless, Jeremy was too busy cleaning up the scene of the crime and covering up his own mistakes to have taken the time to actually help his best friend survive what was apparently an honest mistake. In the end, Jeremy claims that he hauled Bradley out to the family trash bin and tossed him inside. Bradley would remain in the trash bin for an entire week before trash collectors even dumped the bin. Now, we don't know how they didn't discover Brad's remains inside, but somehow they didn't. In the end, Jeremy was arrested and charged in the second degree. Investigators believe there is zero chance that the weapon went off that day accidentally. After inspecting the weapon, detectives say that there's no possibility a simple bump could have caused the weapon to have been discharged. They believe that the trigger was pulled with intent, even if the demise of Bradley was truly just a mistake. Though many people, including investigators, refuse to believe that this was a mistake at all. The sheer fact that Jeremy went to such great lengths to conceal his wrongdoing suggests there may have been far more to this case than Jeremy is willing to admit. 
After all was said and done, Jeremy was convicted and sent to prison for 22 years after being tried as an adult, despite only being 13 when the crime was committed. He entered prison in January of 1998 and was set to be released back in December of 2021, meaning he's now a free man. But the main thing about this case that I just can't wrap my head around is what about Jeremy's parents? Now, I'm not accusing them of anything. That's certainly not my intention. But how could all of this have unfolded without them realizing anything? After all, Jeremy's stepfather, Daniel, claims to have inspected the weapon and even smelled it, yet claimed it had never been fired. He also claimed that all of his ammunition was accounted for, but it couldn't have been because one round had clearly been fired. He also claims that all of his weapons were locked away in the family safe. So does that mean Jeremy had a key or a code to the safe? It's certainly possible that he stole the key from his father without him knowing, but that still doesn't explain how his father claimed there was no hole in the kitchen wall when there certainly was. It also doesn't explain how when Daniel reached out to investigators shortly after the crime, he opened up to them and explained that Jeremy had admitted a weapon had been discharged that day. He even handed in the slug that had allegedly come out of the wall. But this couldn't have been the one that ended Brad's life because we know that Jeremy had already thrown that one away. So this would mean that a total of two rounds had been fired from this weapon, yet Daniel didn't notice the missing ammunition. But if all of this weren't enough, what about the trash bin? Did no one ever take the trash out in the four months since Brad had vanished? Surely one of Jeremy's parents would have noticed all the liquid that was in the bottom of the can and dripping down the sides on the outside of the can. Surely someone would have noticed a boy in the bottom of the bin for that first week. Worse yet, surely someone would have smelled something. Now, like I said, I can't with a clear conscience accuse Jeremy's parents of anything but the whole situation just feels suspicious to me. I hate this so much for Rhonda and the rest of Brad's family. So much more could have been done to save this boy. I even hate it for Jeremy too, because if this was some sort of simple accident or mistake, Jeremy's own panic caused him to lose his best friend and be sent to prison for 22 years, when all of this could have been avoided with a simple phone call for an ambulance. This whole case is just tragic from beginning to end. I just hope that Rhonda was able to make peace with things, even though there's nothing in the world that could bring back her little boy. Noelle Paquette would leave for work every day with two lunches in hand, one for herself and one for a child who was in need. Noelle had been teaching at the St. Matthew's Catholic School for a few months, and she quickly noticed just how many children were in desperate need of help, both financially and emotionally. While it wasn't part of her job description to do so, Noelle went out of her way to help every one of her students as best as she could. The children loved her for it, and she was a favorite teacher for many of the kids. Noelle was on a path to make a tremendous difference in the lives of children who attended St. Matthew's, but her plans were tragically cut short on a cold winter evening in 2013. Detectives say that Noelle was heading home from a New Year's celebration. She was ambushed by two criminals with a hauntingly demented plan for the evening. Investigators believe that Noelle was grabbed before she ever even knew what was going on, and within minutes, her life was over. Police honed in on two primary suspects, but believe me when I say, they are no one that any member of the investigative team would have ever suspected. Noelle Paquette was just 27 years old in 2013. She'd been living in Courtright, Ontario for a while, settling down and finding a job as a substitute school teacher at St. Matthew's Catholic School. There isn't a whole lot of information available about this school online, but I was able to learn that an incredibly large portion of their students are considered to be living in poverty, or at a minimum, in low-income households. To make matters worse, only between 50 and 70% of the students are considered to have passing grades. It's clear that many of these students are in desperate need of help, and Noel wasted no time in jumping into action. Noel was hired at St. Matthew's after another teacher requested time off for maternity leave, meaning Noel would be in charge of this teacher's classroom for several months. Noel was known for having a very unique philosophy for teaching. She didn't just want the children to excel in life, she wanted them to be so-called smash hits, a term she coined to describe the level of success that she vowed to help her children achieve. 
not just in school, but all throughout their lives. As soon as Noelle began working for the school, she noticed that there was a much larger problem plaguing these students than simply their less than ideal grades. It didn't matter that over 60% of students were failing math because nearly 50% of these students' families didn't have enough money to buy proper clothing or food. A shockingly large number of these kids didn't even wear shoes to school, and an even larger number didn't own warm coats for the winter. Noelle wanted to help these students in any way that she could. So she and her mother teamed up to begin buying as much clothing and food for these children as they possibly could. Noelle's mother says that this became a regular occurrence for them, and they would often travel out into town to scrounge up as many of life's essentials as they could find, providing them to the students who needed them most. One of Noelle's closest friends, Kyle, says that this is just the type of person that Noelle was. He says that there was no better profession for Noelle, and she was meant to be a teacher and a guardian for these students. You know, it's often the case that after someone passes away, we only recall the good things about them, and we cover up the bad. But in Noelle's case, she truly was a great person. She cared in a way that is so rare these days, and her character is something that should be celebrated. But Noelle's passion, her drive, and her dedication to her students would meet its end long before her journey should have been over. There are still countless students who truly needed her but their pleas would go unanswered after one cold winter night in January of 2013. I wanna let you guys know about Pia, an amazing VPN service that you can use on any smartphone and also the sponsor of today's video. If you're an active internet user, and since you're watching this video, you are, then you need to know one thing. Everything you do on the internet can be seen by someone else, whether you realize it or not. Using the internet without Pia is like having Facebook post your diary. Your friends and family can all read your secrets. PIA, short for Private Internet Access, uses a virtual private network or a VPN to hide your IP address from would-be hackers, scammers, and other elusive people, and it helps to safeguard your internet connection using an encrypted tunnel. If you're like me, you're probably using Wi-Fi when you're in public places like the supermarket, coffee shop, or even an airport. When you do this, any hackers that may be connected to that same network can see everything you do everything. But with PIA, that will no longer be true. You can even use PIA to grant you access to region-restricted content from all over the world, including hidden content on BBC, Prime Video, Netflix, Hulu, and so much more. One of my favorite reasons for using PIA is to access region-restricted content on Netflix, such movies like The Godfather or Shawshank Redemption, which you can access by switching your location to Germany. One of my favorite things about PIA is that you can use just one subscription to protect all of your devices including your computer, phone, tablet, everything. PIA is the world's most transparent VPN provider, hiding your IP address and encrypting your internet connection, all while giving you access to heaps of content that may have otherwise been hidden from you. Join PIA using my link below to get 83% off your subscription. That's just $2.03 per month. Better yet, PIA is even throwing in an additional four months of protection, absolutely free if you sign up using my custom link. Just go to piavpn.com slash truecrimestories to get 83% off your subscription, then get four additional months completely free. Thanks to PIA for sponsoring today's video. It was just after 2 a.m. on New Year's Day of 2013. Noelle had been attending a New Year's Eve celebration with her boyfriend, something they'd both been looking forward to for quite some time. The party was going relatively well, but at around 2 a.m., Noelle and her boyfriend got into a disagreement. We don't know what prompted this argument, but Noelle felt that things had escalated enough that it would be best if she just left for the evening and headed home. One of Noelle's friends tried her best to stop her, but when Noelle insisted on leaving, the friend decided to leave alongside her. The two walked together for several blocks, but eventually they went their separate ways. The party had been taking place in Sarnia, but Noelle had recently moved to Courtright, just south of Sarnia. She purchased a house here a short while back, and regardless of how long the walk was, Noelle was adamant that she was going to take the long trek back to her home, even though it was quite cold out and in the dead of the night. Noelle and her friends were spotted on several CCTV cameras in the area, but before long, they had wandered out of view and were on their own. Throughout her walk home, Noelle texted her boyfriend several times. It seems that whatever had happened at the party, Noelle was incredibly upset. She was spotted by several witnesses as she wandered through the streets, sobbing about what had taken place. 
Her boyfriend has never spoken up about what transpired that evening, but whatever it was, Noelle was devastated. This brings us to around 2.30 a.m., only about 30 minutes after Noelle had left the party. As she was still within the boundaries of Sarnia, a few witnesses reported seeing a man walking behind her. Considering it was so dark, descriptions of this man were less than helpful, but it seems as though witnesses recalled him following her for quite some time. Within minutes of these witness sightings, Noelle's cell phone activity suddenly stopped. She never responded to her boyfriend's texts after this, and all of her calls went unanswered. Investigators used witness statements to piece together what transpired after this, and they determined that a white Pontiac Grand Prix pulled up alongside Noelle as she was heading home that evening, or early morning at this point. The car was driven by a woman in her early 30s. We don't know what the woman said to Noelle, but after a brief discussion, Noelle seems to have agreed to get inside the car. As soon as she entered, the car switched into reverse and backed up down the street, picking up the man that had been walking behind Noelle all this time. The moment he entered the car, they sped away into the night. About an hour and a half after Noelle had been picked up by the two unidentified strangers, two Ontario police officers had been patrolling the area. This was around 4 a.m. on New Year's Day. As they were patrolling the outskirts of Sarnia, they came across a white Pontiac Grand Prix that had broken down on the side of the road. When officers approached the car, a female stepped out of the driver's seat. She was crying and had blood on her face and hands, pleading with officers to help her, as her boyfriend had just accidentally cut himself in the passenger seat and she wasn't able to help him. Paramedics were called to the scene immediately. One of the paramedics helped out the passenger, treating his injuries and making sure that he was stable before taking him to the local hospital. The occupants of the car were then revealed to be Tanya Bogdanovich, age 32, and Michael McGregor, age 22. When investigators asked what had taken place leading up to Michael's injury, Tanya revealed some pretty interesting details about the two. She said that the two were heading out into the forest to engage in what she called knife play. She explained that this was some sort of risky sexual adventure that they were planning on acting out, but that their car had broken down on the way to the woods. So instead, they decided to act out their fantasy in the car. But things went downhill very quickly when Michael accidentally got cut on his hand. It would later come to light that Tanya's relationship with Michael wasn't even public knowledge. The two had been having an affair behind Tanya's boyfriend's back. Somehow, despite the large amount of time she spent away from home with Michael, her boyfriend was none the wiser. When the two were taken to the hospital, Michael was taken into a room for treatment while Tanya was asked to wait outside of the room. All the while, she was seen with her face pressed against the glass of the observation room, pacing back and forth in the hallway. Several of the staff members believed that she was Michael's mother, but they would soon learn the reality of their relationship. The two never really described themselves as dating. Instead, they merely referred to each other as a best friend or a friend with benefits. Turns out, the two had only known each other for a few months after they met through a website that connects individuals with certain interests. See, Tanya and Michael had rather dark histories of sexual fantasies. I'm not going to get into the specifics of their situation, but they were both interested in very violent activities, and the website that they met on specifically catered to people with these interests. But the problem is, their fantasies weren't just violent. They were full-on dangerous, hence how Michael ended up in the hospital. While they were in the treatment room, after Michael had been patched up, nurses and doctors recalled seeing the two lying down on stretchers, staring at each other, with their hands pressed over their faces, giggling and laughing. It seems that everyone in the emergency room thought that the two were very odd, but they never did anything wrong or illegal, so everyone just let them be. But then news broke that police had just uncovered a body that had been dumped in the woods about 25 kilometers away from the hospital. This is the moment that everyone's mood suddenly changed. The female victim had been subjected to a night of heartbreaking terror, and it was clear that this was not the work of an ordinary person. Whoever had done this to her took pride in their work, and it seemed as though they may have even enjoyed it. It didn't take long before the victim was identified as Noelle Paquette. As investigators showed up to the scene of the crime, they were taken aback by what had transpired. 
As detectives gathered up evidence and information from the scene, they quickly learned that the victim had been jabbed at least 49 times. She'd also been taken advantage of. A coroner revealed that the victim was alive during each and every one of the injuries. She would have lived through all of them, but she likely would have passed away quite quickly after that final strike was dealt. Whoever had done this to her, they were calculated. They wanted her to survive until that final blow. Police spoke with witnesses in the area, but no one had seen much of anything outside of mentioning that they had seen a woman matching Noelle's description walking alone around 2 a.m. But as police gathered up more and more witness statements, they came across the aforementioned witnesses who recalled seeing a white car that morning. Around this same time, Tanya and Michael were released from the hospital. Their car was towed to a nearby compound where it was revealed that the engine had run out of oil, explaining why they'd broken down so unexpectedly. After the two had left the hospital, they made plans to head to the compound lot that afternoon to pick up the car for repairs. But at some point during the day, Michael learned that the injury to his hand was going to require surgery. So the following day, he was asked to return to the hospital for an operation. Police had noticed how strange both Tanya and Michael were acting when they were taken to the hospital earlier that day. But investigators assumed that they were simply strange people, so they didn't think much else about it. But as witness reports of a white car that was spotted around the time of Noelle's disappearance began to pour in, detectives began to wonder if there was more to this story than meets the eye. It seems that police were hot on the trail of both Tanya and Michael long before they knew that they were even being suspected in Noelle's disappearance. As mentioned, the two had planned to pick up their car from the compound later that afternoon. But police were quick to react and they asked the tow driver to hold on to the vehicle and not give it back to the couple until they had time to search it first. The tow driver agreed and held on to the car. We're not sure what the two were told when they arrived to pick up the car later on, but the tow driver did manage to ward them off while police conducted an investigation. When police searched the vehicle, they found that it was covered in red stains. To make matters worse, they even found a knife on the floorboard on the driver's side of the car. The knife appeared to have been cleaned off since the incident, but considering the state of the rest of the car, this did little to help. It seems that Tanya and Michael explained this discovery away as being related to Michael's hand injury but the police weren't so sure. This is around the time that the most concerning witness report of all was submitted to officers. Not only had a white sedan been seen in the area that morning, but a witness proclaimed to have seen the driver of the car pick up Noel. But that wasn't all. The witness also reported seeing Michael get into that same vehicle after Tanya had reversed to pick him up. At this point, police knew that there was much more to the story than Tanya and Michael were letting on. But the problem was, they needed to establish a motive. Otherwise, all three of these people may have just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Without a motive, the case was sure to be kicked out of court. This led officers much deeper down a rabbit hole than they could have ever anticipated. When detectives really began to dig into the past of both Tanya and Michael, they quickly realized just how bizarre their relationship really was. The things these two were involved in were just plain weird. The two were big fans of the TV series Archer, so much so that Michael actually went by the name Archer, and Tanya went by the name Kane, referencing two of the lead characters from the series. Anytime Tanya referred to Michael, she would always address him as Archer. But everyone has pet names for people that they're close with. That's not terribly unusual. What makes these two so strange is just how far they were willing to go to satisfy their sexual desires, even if it meant hurting other people. The two met as a result of their dark fantasies, but what really helped them bond was how they each had a desire to end the life of a woman. Police were able to uncover texts that had been sent between the two that documented how they both longed to end the life of a female by taking advantage of her then using a knife to finish the job. But this wasn't just some demented, hateful desire. The two wanted to do it for sexual gratification. Detectives revealed that they also found text messages that proves that the two had lined up a victim for that evening. But for one reason or another, things fell apart and the victim never showed. This was the information investigators needed to secure a conviction. They'd finally tracked down a motive, at least for the most part. But they still needed to identify why the two had chosen Noel specifically. That same day, officers issued a warrant for the arrest of both Tanya and Michael. 
By this point, Michael had already returned to the hospital to have the procedure performed on his hand. Tanya was patiently waiting inside the hospital to hear about Michael's recovery. As she left the hospital later that day, she was arrested in the parking lot and taken in for questioning. Michael was released a few hours later and picked up outside of a hotel. When police got the two into interrogation rooms, all the pieces started to fit together perfectly. The two confirmed their relationship with one another and the violent sexual desires that they shared. Once they knew that they had nowhere to run, they even opened up about their intention to claim the life of an innocent woman that night. But they both insisted that Noel was not their initial target. As more of the story was pieced together, detectives learned that they merely chose to attack Noel because she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Her attack was completely random. After their initial victim was a no-show, the two were strolling the streets in their car when they happened to pass by Noel. When they saw her, Tanya turned the car around and dropped Michael off a short distance behind Noel. He stalked her while Tanya jumped back into action, eventually convincing Noel to get into the car with her. That's when she reversed and picked up Michael, driving Noel over 20 kilometers away into the woods to carry out their fantasy. Noel had made significant efforts to fight back, but she just couldn't do it. Tanya and Michael were both handed mandatory life sentences for their crimes, but this did little to calm the minds of Noel's family. Impact statements were read by all of those who knew Noel, and despite their thoughtless crimes against an innocent woman, it seems as though Tanya and Michael may have actually realized the brevity of the situation. Both Tanya and Michael apologized profusely to Noel's family and friends, though they admitted that their apologies likely meant nothing compared to the nightmare that the family was living through. Michael addressed his own family, admitting that he had let them down and shamed them. Tanya expressed her regret at not confessing to the crime sooner, but their words may as well have fallen on deaf ears, because words can't change things, only actions can. In the wake of this tragedy, Noelle's family worked together to establish a charity known as Noelle's Gift. Her family recognized just how far Noelle was willing to go to help out students at St. Matthew's Catholic School. And with this in mind, they made it their life's goal to help Noelle's memory stay alive and to continue helping the students that she loved so dearly. The charity was established as a way to raise funds for children who come from poverty-stricken homes and may not have adequate food, clothing, or life essentials. So far, the charity has been an incredible success, and so many children have had their lives changed forever in Noel's memory. In 22 alone, the charity managed to bring in over $158,000 for children in need. In 2023, they gathered more than $188,000 for these children, with teachers at St. Matthew's School having direct access to this money to make sure that every single child gets the help they need. And these funds offer enough assistance to help out a minimum of 940 children. Noelle's final moments on this planet were marred by a heartless, callous crime. But in the wake of her absence, Noelle's family has proven that they will stop at nothing to ensure that her kindness, her compassion, and her genuine love for her children will never, ever be forgotten. Amanda Doss was just 34 years old in 2011. She was at home on the afternoon of May 11, 2011, alongside her two children and a friend, when all of a sudden, someone clutching a knife unleashed on the family, then fled the scene of the crime. Just minutes later, the house went up in flames, destroying nearly every trace of evidence that had been left behind by this callous criminal. By the time detectives and investigators arrived at the scene of the crime, the smoke had settled, but the real mystery had only just begun. Who could have done such a thing to such a harmless family? Police would soon learn that the truth was much stranger than fiction, and it only took them about three months to get to the bottom of this heartless crime after a suspect made a startling confession. Amanda Doss was born in Muskogee, Oklahoma in August of 1976. Muskogee is located just outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and is home to around 36,000 people as of 2020. There isn't anything particularly interesting about Muskogee, it's a pretty ordinary town filled with ordinary people doing their best in life, and Amanda certainly fit that bill. Amanda moved at some point along the way, deciding to settle in Texarkana, Texas, a town that shares its border with Arkansas. 
Specifically, Amanda moved to Redwater, Texas, a small suburban area of Texarkana, with a population of about 853 people. We don't know too terribly much about Amanda's personal life, but we know that she must have gotten married somewhere along the way, as her maiden name is listed as Pruitt instead of Doss. Amanda gave birth to her first child, Guinevere, in August of 1999. Gwen was known for being a wonderful child, attending Redwater Middle School as she grew older. She was an active member of the Girl Scouts and all around a great kid. Gwen was remembered for being a selfless little girl who always cared about others. In fact, when she was just nine years old, she decided to give all of her birthday and Christmas money, including her presents, to a local orphanage. Every month for the rest of that year, Gwen and Amanda would work together to bake cakes and bring gifts and ice cream to all the children who were having birthdays each month. Just four years after the birth of Gwen, Amanda gave birth to her second child, a boy named Texas. Texas was born in May of 2003 and, much like his sister, was recalled for being an all-around great little boy. Following in his sister's footsteps, Texas decided to join the Boy Scouts and even attended Redwater School District as well. Amanda and her two children were known for being a happy family, and it seems they all got along well. But no amount of happiness could save the family from the impending tragedy that was about to strike. One that would destroy their notion of safety and leave behind nothing but ash and rubble. Before we continue with today's case, I needed to give you guys somewhat of a PSA. You probably didn't know this, but all of your online data might be getting sold to shady companies or individuals without you having any idea. At this very moment, there are thousands of data brokers out there that scour the corners of the internet simply looking to buy people's personal info so that they can sell it off to someone else and make a profit. This can include anything from your address to your phone number to bank account info or maybe even your social security number. The info they can get a hold of would seriously shock you. The good news is that you have the legal right to reach out to these people and request that they delete your info. But the bad news is that this would take you years to do on your own. That's why I've partnered with Incogni, because they'll do the work for you without you even needing to lift a finger. Incogni will reach out to thousands of data brokers on your behalf and request that they delete your data from their database, virtually eliminating your online presence automatically. All it takes is creating an account and providing Incogni with a few personal details so that they can better identify you. Then allow Incogni the right to work on your behalf. After this, you just have to sit back and watch them get to work. They'll keep you updated every step of the way. Some great examples of how your data gets into the wrong hands is, say you sign up for a free newsletter, then start receiving tons of spam immediately afterward. Maybe you're researching some medical complications, then start seeing ads for medical services you were never even interested in. The list goes on and on. Incogni is truly an invaluable tool, and I'm honored to be able to work with them to help you guys get the protection that you deserve. All you need to do to get started is click the link in the description below or use the code TIEKNOTS to get started. By using my personal code, the first 100 people to sign up will get 60% off your Incogni subscription. Thanks to Incogni for sponsoring today's video. It was May 11th, 2011. Amanda, Gwen, and Texas had settled into their home for the evening, going about their usual nightly routines of having dinner, taking showers, watching TV, and eventually getting ready for bed. But this night's series of events would be much different. It was around 3 a.m. The children had been tucked away in bed, but Amanda seems to have still been awake, based on a report given by the Texarkana Gazette. At 3 a.m., a knock came at the family's front door. Amanda headed over to the door to see who it was, and she was greeted by 17-year-old Rachel Pittman. Rachel was an old family friend who would often come over and babysit the two children, and Amanda welcomed her into her home with open arms, as she had many times before. Rachel was someone that the Doss children looked up to as somewhat of an older sister. But unfortunately for the family, this visit would be far different from the many other times that Rachel had stopped by. Over the years, Rachel and Amanda had become friends with the woman who's never been named by police or news outlets. She's only ever referred to as the woman, so I guess police chose to keep her anonymous for some reason. For the sake of the story, we'll refer to her as Tanya, just to make things simpler to understand. It's unclear what relation Tanya had to Rachel, 
But we know that Tanya was an adult, while Rachel, as mentioned, was merely 17. Tanya had moved out of state about five or six months before this, but she kept in touch with Rachel all the time. Reports claim that Tanya had previously lived near both Rachel and the Doss family, allegedly living just a few houses away in the same neighborhood. Tanya, Rachel, and Amanda Doss were all known to have been close friends, or at the very least, close neighbors. They'd often spend time together at Amanda Doss's house, sharing drinks and stories and generally being friendly with one another. But before long, darkness started to creep in. Rachel was considered by most people to have been a typical teenage girl. But as she grew older, she began to show signs of being a bit unusual, so to speak. I say this because, according to Rachel, she believed that Tanya wanted to end Amanda's life. But Tanya claims she never suggested anything of the sort, nor did she have any bad intentions towards Amanda. They both got along great and enjoyed each other's company. But for Rachel, the message was loud and clear. Stepping back to the night in question, May 11th, Rachel arrived at Amanda's home at around 3 a.m. Once Amanda asked her to come inside, the two sat down and chatted for a while, talking about anything and everything. While Amanda was more than twice Rachel's age, the two were great friends and often confided in one another. But this particular get-together would be unlike anything Amanda could have expected. After the two spoke for a while, Rachel got up and began heading toward the door, suggesting to Amanda that she was ready to leave. But no sooner than she reached the door, Rachel grabbed a knife that she'd been hiding in the waistband of her pants, turned around, and ran towards Amanda. She ended Amanda's life in a matter of seconds, but at some point during the scuffle, Gwen and Texas woke up. To be completely upfront with you, the details of how things unfolded past this point are not very clear, but it appears as though Gwen knew something was wrong and ran away in fear. Rather than call the police though, Gwen grabbed a phone and called her grandparents. The call was incredibly confusing for her grandparents, as Gwen doesn't appear to have said anything that could be understood. All her grandparents heard were shouts and screams in the background of the call, followed by Gwen shouting for her mother. As any good grandparent would do, the two threw their shoes on and jumped in the car, driving as fast as they possibly could toward the Dawes household. As they neared the home, their jaws hit the floor. They truly couldn't believe their eyes. The entire home had gone up in flames, and they knew that their daughter and two grandchildren were trapped inside. They whipped their car into the driveway and without a second of hesitation, jumped out of the car and ran straight into the burning building. They found Gwen lying on the ground and pulled her from the fire. As they did so, both of the grandparents suffered severe burns that forced them to be admitted to the hospital later on. While they managed to pull Gwen from the blaze, they couldn't locate Amanda or Texas. Unfortunately, as the fire grew hotter, they were forced to admit that both of them were gone. Paramedics arrived at the scene just moments later. The grandparents were treated for their injuries and sent to the hospital, but as paramedics checked on Gwen, they realized that they were far too late and she was gone. The fire continued to rage on for hours after this, and it wouldn't be until the following day that the fire department was able to put out the flames, allowing investigators to survey the scene of the incident and do their best to determine what had taken place. Initially, detectives believed that the fire had been caused by a faulty electrical outlet, one of the leading causes of home fires. But as they retrieved the charred remains of the Doss family from the rubble, they realized that what they had stumbled upon was something far worse. As police did their best to piece together the evidence from the scene of the fire, they quickly realized that things simply weren't adding up. When the fire experts began to analyze the incident, they found that some sort of accelerant had been used. Worse yet, the body of Amanda appeared to have been where the fire had originated. For police, they knew that this meant one thing. The fire had not been caused by some sort of electrical short. Rather, it was intentionally set and detectives began to believe it had been done in order to conceal evidence of a murder. Police scheduled interviews with the local media outlets and announced what they had uncovered, offering a reward of over $40,000 for information leading to the arrest of the individual who committed this crime. But despite such a hefty reward, no tips were ever called in that led to the suspect being caught. Police spent weeks searching every square inch of the property for even the slightest clue, but they repeatedly came up empty-handed. But after about three weeks of searching, a tip was called in from a woman who lived all the way out in California. 
the woman who's never been identified was very direct in her statements. She claimed that she knew for a fact that Rachel Pittman, the 17-year-old babysitter, was behind the murder. Now, we don't know why she believed this or why she was so certain about it, but regardless, police didn't take the tip seriously. Now, many people may be quick to blame investigators for this, but in reality, you have to admit that the tip seems pretty strange. After all, Rachel was a child and a close family friend. But more than anything else, how would someone in California have such pertinent information about a crime that was committed in Texas? Well, as weeks passed by, police did their best to follow up on almost every lead they received, but they never managed to get around to speaking with Rachel. The tip was considered low priority for officers, and they felt their services would have been more useful investigating other suspects. It would be three months before police ever got any closer to locating the person responsible for this disaster. During this time, another $100,000 had been added to the reward for information, and soon enough, they would receive a call that turned the case on its head. As months passed by, it seemed as though Rachel's conscience had begun to catch up with her. The past always finds a way to catch up with you, and for Rachel, the guilt was becoming more than she could bear. One day, Rachel had been at her mother's home. We don't know the specifics of their conversation, but Rachel's mother detected that something was bothering her. After speaking for a few minutes, Rachel finally opened up and confessed what had taken place. She told her mother everything. Rachel openly confessed to the crime, but this is where things get pretty incredible. A mother's instinct is almost always to protect her children, but in this case, Rachel's mother could do no such thing. She knew the gravity of the situation and, without hesitation, called the police. The officer who accepted the call remembers that Rachel's mother was filled with grief, sobbing as she revealed what her daughter had confessed to. Interestingly, submitting a tip like this would have made Rachel's mother eligible to receive the $140,000 reward that had been set up, but she even went as far as refusing the money. Now, I don't know anything about the type of person that Rachel's mother is, but this act alone proves that she must have been a person of character. That's a ton of money to just turn it down. Soon enough, detectives arrived and Rachel turned herself over to the police without a fight. But it's what she revealed to police after the fact that really sets this case apart, because it took investigators by surprise and revealed a whole new aspect of the story that no one saw coming. When Rachel was in police custody, she came clean about everything, revealing every last detail about what had unfolded that day in 2011. She explained that she'd been speaking with Tanya and that Tanya had asked her to end Amanda's life. More specifically, Rachel claimed that Tanya asked her to end Amanda's life, but that she should do it when the children weren't home, as there would be no need for them to be caught up in the crime. Rachel claims that Tanya's request sounded urgent, and the more they spoke, the more Rachel felt as though this crime was a now-or-never situation. Thus, she decided to move forward with the crime without waiting for the children to leave, resulting in the entire family losing their lives. While this explains most of the story, it doesn't explain one major detail. If Rachel merely ended the lives of the family, then how did a fire break out? Well, the entire crime was premeditated from beginning to end. Rachel knew that if she took out the entire family, she was almost certain to leave behind some form of evidence, even if she did her best not to. So on her way to the family home, she decided to get a two liter soda bottle and fill it with gasoline. After carrying out the most gruesome part of the crime, she grabbed the bottle, doused the victims in fuel, and then set the house on fire, eliminating virtually any piece of evidence she may have left behind. But there's one part of the crime that Rachel didn't anticipate. During the scuffle, she accidentally cut herself with the knife that she'd been using to carry out the attack, causing a pretty serious injury to her arm. After she set the house on fire, she ran back home to clean herself up before anybody would notice. She did all of this without anyone ever realizing she'd even stepped out of her home in the first place. But in the chaos of all this, Rachel had jumped a fence connected to the Doss family property. So after cleaning up at home, she ran back to the Doss's fence to clean up any prints or evidence she may have left behind, again without being noticed by anyone. Once she got back home, Rachel removed her clothing and burned it in the backyard along with her shoes. To top this off, she took the knife that she'd used that evening and broke it into 20 pieces, 
scattering the metal in the woods behind her house and burning the handle in the same pile that she burned her clothes in. Police were able to recover most of the pieces of the knife that Rachel had scattered in the woods, but nothing else was found. But as she spoke with investigators, they began to realize that there was much more to this story than meets the eye. Specifically, police were interested in the portion of Rachel's alibi in which she mentioned Tanya asking her to carry out the crime. Police tracked Tanya down and listened to her version of events. As they would quickly learn, Tanya had no ill will toward the Doss family at all and considered them to be close friends. But if this is true, then why had Rachel lied? Well, she didn't. Sort of. When someone commits a crime of this magnitude, police will usually send the person in for a mental health analysis to determine if they may be suffering from some sort of mental health disorder. In Rachel's case, investigators were stunned by the reports that came back from multiple psychiatric investigations. One of the professionals believed that Rachel had been suffering from a form of paranoid schizophrenia. They believed that, in a way, Rachel had been telling the truth about Tanya. See, Rachel did truly believe that Tanya had asked her to take out Amanda Doss, but this simply didn't happen. According to the psychiatrist, the conversation that Rachel had with Tanya was nothing more than a twisted delusion. While the two did speak shortly before Amanda lost her life, the content of their discussion had nothing to do with Rachel claiming Amanda's life. The psychiatrist believes that Rachel's own mind was able to spin an ordinary conversation into a request for murder. This effectively cleared Tanya of any involvement, but many people question whether or not this cleared Rachel of involvement as well. Now, obviously, Rachel was the one who committed the crime, but if she wasn't of a sound mind, could she really be held accountable for such a tragedy? Well, according to one psychiatrist, Rachel knew that what she was doing was morally wrong. She knew that taking someone's life was, well, bad. The fact that she took every opportunity to conceal her involvement proved this. But the doctor believes that Rachel felt as though it was her only option, and in essence was the right thing to do, for whatever reason. A second psychiatrist weighed in and said that Rachel knew that her actions were wrong, but that she was influenced by statements made on television, billboards, and even conversations that didn't involve her. Rachel found hidden meaning in these various avenues and believed that the universe was telling her to do it, so she did. In one interview with doctors, Rachel spoke about hearing snakes that began talking to her. She believed these snakes were demons, and she also believed she could see ghosts. Later on, she mentioned encountering a pink cloud that she believed harbored the souls of her three victims. The doctors claimed that Rachel only decided to turn herself in after she made a deeper commitment to her religion presumably in an attempt to ward off these so-called demons. Now, as you might expect, Rachel's defense team wanted to enter a plea of insanity. And if her doctors are correct in their analysis, who could blame them? Rachel has exhibited every possible sign of being mentally ill, and the crime very clearly appears to have been committed while Rachel was dealing with serious mental challenges. But in the end, for reasons that I just can't seem to understand, Rachel decided to plead guilty to the charges placed against her. Rather obviously, because of her age, Rachel was placed in a juvenile detention center. But unfortunately, things only got worse for her from here. Her behavior behind bars greatly concerned the staff at the correctional facility. They say that she developed a cult following behind bars, and that she was very disrespectful to the staff members. She would often speak to her friends and followers about God's forgiveness, but she would do so in a warped and distorted way. While she gave outward appearances of being a calm and collected person, the slightest mention of her doing anything wrong would cause her to turn cold and distance. Ever since her incarceration, Rachel's behavior has been truly terrible. Reports about her stay in prison stopped being reported in 2012, but in that year alone, she's known to have begun multiple fights with multiple inmates. She attempted to break out of her cell. She knocked out an inmate's tooth, stuffed paper into the lock of her cell door so that she could open it whenever she wanted, and was caught plotting an attack against another inmate. One time, she successfully broke out of her cell and wandered off into the prison, doing her own thing. She even managed to get a hold of a blade from a pencil sharpener, but rather than use it to attack someone, she used it to cut her hair off so that her hair couldn't be used against her in a fight. 
All of the prison staff believe that Rachel needs some form of medical intervention if she has any chance of getting better. But there's been no word on whether or not this will be mandated. As it stands, she's now being held in an adult women's prison in Texas, but as far as we know, she's still shown no signs of improvement. She's expected to be eligible for parole after spending another 19 years behind bars, but unless she gets the mental help that she needs, it probably goes without saying that Rachel will never see the light of day again. Skylar Neese was your typical teenage girl from Pennsylvania. She had a couple close friends that she depended on and didn't have any real struggles in her life outside of the typical teenage grievances of relationships and identity. But on June 5th, 2012, Skylar climbed out of her apartment window at midnight to head out on a late night adventure with two of her best friends. This was supposed to be a fun girls night out, but Skylar would never make it home. Skylar Niece was a young girl who'd never really made any enemies. She was incredibly smart for her age, not just smart, but wise as well. She was an honor student at school, and all of her teachers knew that she had a very bright future ahead of her. She never got into much trouble and certainly never gained any unwanted attention from her peers. She was about as clean cut and honest as a teenage girl could be. One of Skylar's favorite activities was reading. She could lose herself in a book for hours, only to snap out of it long past her bedtime, not even realizing she'd spent her whole afternoon in a fairy tale. Skylar also had a job at Wendy's that she appears to have loved, as she never missed a day of work, no matter the cost. For a teenager to be so dedicated to a job at a fast food chain, it just further shows you that Skylar was a girl of character. Skylar was incredibly close to her friends Shelia and Rachel. The trio did everything together. It's actually difficult to find individual photos of each of them online because in virtually every photo I can find, the three are together either hugging or posing for the camera. These three were the very definition of inseparable. The three also went to school together, attending University High School in Morgantown, West Virginia. Skylar had reportedly known Sheila since the two were just eight years old, but Rachel would join the two during freshman year in high school, becoming an irreplaceable member of their friend group. According to Skylar's parents, Skylar wasn't just best friends with the two. In fact, she was more of a mentor than anything else. Unfortunately, both Shelia and Rachel had parents who had recently divorced, leaving both of the kids shaken and honestly probably a bit confused about where to go from here. Skylar was in a much different situation. She was an only child, and her parents were very close with her, making sure she was making the best decisions for herself and passing on the wisdom that they could offer. Skylar, in turn, would pass this wisdom on to her friends. Her mom recalled several occasions where Skylar could be overheard on the phone giving great advice to her friends, scolding them if they did something that she thought was dumb and helping them make good decisions in the wake of their father or mother's absence. Skylar's mother also says that Shelia became so close that she didn't even knock on their door when she came over. She just walked in and was treated like one of their daughters. The only rift in the relationship between Skylar and Shelia was that Shelia didn't come from a particularly religious family. Skylar, on the other hand, came from a Catholic household that was strong in their beliefs. To an extent, Skylar envied Shelia's freedom and ability to do virtually whatever she wanted. But it was this very freedom that would ultimately lead to Skylar's downfall. By May of 2012, cracks had begun to form in the relationship between the three girls. This was proven by a tweet that Skylar posted, passive-aggressively calling someone close to her a rather hurtful name, adding that her friend thought she'd never find out about something, but we don't know for sure what this something was. She followed this tweet up with another one a few days later, saying, Too bad my friends are having lives without me. It seems pretty clear to assume that Shelia and Rachel may have been getting pretty close with one another behind Skylar's back, and Skylar certainly wasn't happy about this, and she began getting jealous. According to one of Skylar's classmates, Daniel, Skylar and Shelia had begun to fight nonstop over the last few months. He recalled a moment during sophomore year when Rachel was on her phone during class. Rachel leaned over to Daniel and said, listen to this. She put the phone against his ear and he could hear Skylar and Shelia arguing with each other. 
According to Daniel, Shelia knew that the two were about to get into an argument, so she secretly called Rachel so that Rachel could listen as the two went at it. This would be the final argument the girls ever got into. Not because they made up and became friends again, but because of something far worse. On July 6th, everything would change for Skylar's parents when they woke up to find that Skylar had gone missing. When she didn't show up for work later that day, her parents knew something was wrong. Their first thought was that she might have run away, but when they learned that her phone charger, toothbrush, and bathroom supplies were all still in her room, they knew something was wrong and they reported their daughter missing immediately. CCTV footage would soon reveal that Skylar had snuck out of her apartment's bedroom window around midnight on July 5th. She was seen getting into a sedan, but no one knew at the time who was driving the car. This would be the last time that Skylar was seen alive. Skylar's mom was naturally worried sick about her daughter. It seems that Shelia and Rachel caught wind of this, so Shelia called Skylar's mother to tell her the story of the last time that she had seen Skylar. According to Shelia, she'd convinced Skylar to sneak out of the house so that the three could hang out that evening, driving around Star City and generally having a good time. Shelia confessed that the three were under the influence that evening, but explained that the two had dropped Skylar off at the entrance of their street a few hours later because Skylar didn't want the sound of a car engine or headlights to wake up her parents. Shelia claims that she and Rachel picked up Skylar sometime around 11 p.m. that night, assuring Skylar's mom that Skylar was dropped off just before midnight. But the CCTV footage from that evening proves that Skylar left the apartment at exactly 12.35 and she would never return. Shelia would show up to Skylar's home in the following days to help search for Skylar and try to round up any clues or evidence, but there was none to be found. Rachel was absent during this time because she'd been sent off to Catholic camp for the summer. It was around this time that rumors had begun to circulate around the school and local neighborhoods, suggesting that the girls had actually been to a party that night and that Skylar had overdosed. These rumors grew so concerning that the local police were forced to take them seriously, with one supposed witness telling a police officer that Skylar had overdosed and the partygoers had panicked, so they hid her body. The only problem with this story is that one detective had a gut feeling that this was nothing more than a lie. Now, in reality, detectives can't use a gut feeling to pursue leads during an investigation, but this situation was a bit different. The investigator says that when she spoke with Shelia and Rachel about the evening of the supposed party, the two girls shared the exact same story. But not only were the details of the story the same, but their stories matched word for word, almost as if they had rehearsed the whole thing. The investigator says that every alarm in her brain was going off, telling her that these girls were not telling the truth. But without any evidence of foul play, police couldn't do anything other than continue with their investigation. When police began to dig into Skylar's social media history, they quickly uncovered that the afternoon before she vanished, she posted several derogatory marks about Shelia and Rachel. This made it quite clear to police that something was going on between these girls, and it seems incredibly unlikely that they had all happily attended a party together just a few hours later. But this is when one investigator had a great idea that may have just helped to blow the case wide open. Detective Chris Berry had an epiphany. He'd been in the police force for a number of years, and he recalled that many criminals will often brag about their crimes after the fact, hoping for clout or respect from their peers. Even though the police didn't have any hard evidence to prove that Shelia and Rachel were involved in Skylar's disappearance, he came up with a plan to try to lure the girls into confessing, that is, if they were in fact involved. He decided to create a fake online profile, disguising himself as a teenage boy who went to West Virginia University. He befriended both Shelia and Rachel on Facebook and Twitter, allowing investigators to have virtually limitless access to both of the suspect's social media accounts. It was a few weeks after this that detectives noticed a strange post that was made by Shelia. In the tweet, she said, No one on this earth can handle me and Rachel. If you think you can, you're wrong. While this post wasn't incriminating, it certainly raised a few eyebrows. Around this same time, though, police feared that their cover might soon get blown. There had been rumors circulating on social media claiming that Julia and Rachel were behind Skylar's disappearance. In some instances, people had directly tweeted at the girls outright accusing the girls of taking Skylar's life. 
As days passed by, the two retreated from social media a bit, putting a huge damper on the probe that officers had been performing. But then they struck gold. As they were searching through Shilia's social media accounts, they noticed a photo that caught them off guard. She had posted an image of her car, and the car bore a striking resemblance to the one that had been picking Skylar up that evening. Now, this may not sound like much of a breakthrough considering that Shilia had already told Skylar's mother that the three had been out partying that night when Skylar vanished. But for investigators, this was now concrete photographic proof that Shelia was the last person to have seen Skylar alive. Police now cross-referenced CCTV footage from all over town, searching for footage of Shelia's car near the locations where she claimed the three had been that evening. Turns out they hadn't visited any of the locations they claimed they had. In fact, Shelia claimed that they'd been hanging out on the eastern side of the city that night, but CCTV footage placed them on the west side of town. While this certainly proved that the girls were lying, it still wasn't enough to lead to any charges being filed. But that's when the unthinkable happened, and one of the suspects opened up about what had really happened that night. On December 28th, 2012, a 911 call rang into the local station about a teenage girl who had seemingly lost her mind. The woman on the other end of the phone was explaining to the dispatcher that her daughter had suffered some sort of a breakdown. She explained that she'd become violent, was striking her parents, and running all throughout the neighborhood screaming. This caller was Patricia Schof, Rachel's mother. In the call, Rachel can be heard in the background shouting for her mother to give her the phone, screaming, this is over, repeatedly. When police arrived, Rachel had enough. She couldn't keep things a secret any longer, and she was ready to talk. She opened up to investigators and confessed that she and Shelia had taken Skylar's life. In a twist, she explained that the two had been plotting the crime for more than a month before going through with it. Rachel explained that they were complaining to one another about Skylar while they were in science class one day. It was then that they proposed the idea of claiming Skylar's life. Rachel agreed to bring a shovel from her dad's house, and Shelia agreed to steal two knives from her mother's kitchen. They both also brought along cleaning supplies and a change of clothes. The two then concocted a lie to convince Skylar to come hang out with them that evening, setting aside their differences and offering a truce. Once Skylar was in the car with them, they claimed that they wanted to find a spot out in the woods where they could smoke and hang out, and Skylar was on board with this plan. All three headed off into a patch of woods. Skylar was taking the lead, with Rachel and Shelia walking close behind her. Then, without notice, the two pounced and began attacking Skylar. She broke free of the two at one point and tried to run away, but the girls eventually caught up and overpowered her, striking her time and time again. The only thing Skylar was able to ask her attackers before she lost her life was why. When the two girls were taken to trial, they were asked this exact question, why? According to Rachel, their motive was simple. They didn't like her. This was the only excuse she ever gave for their actions. Needless to say, both girls were charged with homicide. In court, Rachel pleaded guilty, hoping to be given a more lenient sentence for her participation in helping officers bring the case to a close. Thankfully, they weren't playing into her games and did their very best to have Rachel locked away for life. Unfortunately, this wasn't possible because Rachel was a minor at the time of the crime. Thankfully, officers won a bid to have her tried as an adult, and she was eventually sentenced to 30 years in prison, with the possibility of parole after 10 years, meaning she's eligible to apply for parole right now. In fact, on May 9th of 2023, her parole application was denied, meaning she'll be locked away in prison for at least a few more years. This brings us to Shelia, the alleged mastermind behind most of the plan. Shelia never admitted guilt and even entered a not guilty plea at her trial, despite the fact that her best friend had just confessed and implicated her in the crime. In the end, Shelia was tried as an adult as well, but she won't be eligible for parole until sometime around 2028. Both of the girls are now in their 20s and they're being held at the Lakin Correctional Center in Mason County. Skylar's memory will not be soon forgotten. And thankfully, her case led to a major update in the procedure for missing teenagers in West Virginia. Before Skyler's disappearance, it was the state's policy that families needed to wait 48 hours before they could report a teenager missing. 
But in West Virginia, it's now the law that when a teenager goes missing, an Amber Alert is issued immediately, provided that the child is believed to be in some sort of danger. When this bill was proposed to the West Virginia House of Delegates, the law was approved with a 98-0 to 0 vote, making it an unprecedented success. Skylar Neese lost her life for reasons that are almost unbelievable. It doesn't seem real how two teenage girls could dislike one of their peers so much that they're willing to take her life. After stories like this, I always try to find a silver lining, but there just isn't one in this scenario. Skylar had the rest of her life taken away from her because two selfish teenagers were so hot-headed that they couldn't put some dumb feud behind them. I just hope that in the next life, Skylar was able to find peace. It was 2007 when Carly Ryan fell head over heels for her boyfriend, Brandon Kane. Investigators say that the two had everything in common, but Brandon had a few dark secrets that Carly was blissfully unaware of. Detectives would learn that Carly and Brandon had been dating for several months leading up to the crime, and everything was going well for the two. But one day in February of 2007, things would take a dark turn when Carly failed to return home from a night out with her friends. She'd been acting somewhat strange in the moments before leaving that day, repeatedly asking her mother for hugs. It seems almost like she knew something was wrong, but she was powerless to stop it. Carly's mother certainly felt that something was a bit off that evening, but she could have never imagined just how terrifying things were about to become. Carly Ryan was born in January of 1992 in Stirling, South Australia. She was raised by her mother, Sonia, for most of her childhood, but there's never been any mention about what happened to her father, so I suppose it can be assumed that he was simply out of the picture. The thing about Carly is that she was growing up in the midst of a social media hurricane. By the time she was a teenager, it seemed like there was a new social media platform coming out every other day of the week. And this was long before Facebook was the Goliath that it is today. Most of this case takes place back in 2006 and 7, so we're talking about the days of MySpace, Zanga, Tumblr, and the countless other online messengers that were around. It was an incredibly interesting time to be on the internet, but it was also a remarkably dangerous time because many of the safeguards that are in place today simply didn't exist back then. Considering Carly was just a teenager at this time, her mother, Sonia, was pretty critical about what Carly got up to online. Carly and Sonia were remarkably close, meaning Sonia knew pretty much every detail of Carly's life. She'd often walk by the computer and take a peek at what Carly was doing, but knowing that her teenage daughter was a smart girl, she trusted that Carly was being safe and cautious. Sonia says that she feels like she knew everything that was going on in Carly's life. She knew all of her friends, kept tabs on what was going on at school, and was an ever-present force in all that Carly did. Not in a helicopter parent kind of way, but in a pretty healthy mother-daughter relationship kind of way. You've got to remember it was just the two of them, so they were understandably super close. But the main issue here is that at this point in history, the internet was wild to put it lightly. Carly was known to spend a lot of time on a website called RateMyBody.com. For those of you that aren't familiar with this site, well, it's pretty much exactly what you would think. People post photos of themselves, and anonymous users rate that person's body. The big problem with this website is that, as we've already established, there were virtually no safeguards in place. The website prided itself on anonymity, and that means that there was no way of knowing if the images you were looking at even belonged to the person who uploaded them. Worse yet, considering this website was often visited by teenagers, well, I think you get the picture I'm painting here. This was not a safe website, and it was a major hotspot for older men who had some rather nefarious intentions. Thankfully, this website has since been shut down. But Carly was often described as a scene girl. This is a bit of a vague term that's most often used when referring to teens or young adults who are super interested in the gothic punk lifestyle. These would have been the kids listening to bands like Blackville Brides, Asking Alexandria Escape the Fate, 
all while reading Twilight or something similar, wearing all black from head to toe, black hoodies, black headphones, so on and so forth. And don't think I'm saying this in a judgy or joke kind of way, I was one of those kids too. Heck, I still listen to all of those bands. Dying Is Your Latest Fashion, one of the greatest punk albums of all time. For Carly, this was a group of people and a lifestyle that gave her a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging. She was known for being pretty active on websites like VampireFreaks.com, which is another goth or emo website and store. But most of all, she would spend hours upon hours on MySpace. Her profile was pretty much everything you would imagine it to be. It was full of gothic selfies, heaps of makeup, links to all of her favorite online forums, quotes from her favorite books, typical MySpace stuff. By sharing her interest in this genre of entertainment, Carly was able to make dozens of online friends. But there was one friend in particular who really caught Carly's interest, an 18-year-old named Brandon Kane. Brandon was a young musician who was born in Texas but had recently moved to Brisbane, Australia, the total opposite side of the country from Carly. The two immediately became friends as soon as they met. They liked all the same bands, had all the same interests. It was almost like they were meant to be. Before too long, their relationship grew into something more. Carly began to share stories of her new online friend with her real-life friends. It wasn't too long after this that Carly stopped referring to him as simply a friend. He was now considered her boyfriend. All of Carly's closest friends knew about Brandon, and Sonia knew about him too. It seems that in the early days of their relationship, Sonia was happy that her daughter had met someone that she could be so open with. Even though Brandon was a few years older, Sonia didn't find this too concerning. She mentioned that she would look over Carly's shoulder from time to time to see what the two were chatting about, but she never noticed anything suspicious or anything that concerned her in any way. Before long, the two started video chatting with one another, and by all means, Brandon appeared to be the guy that he claimed to be. Carly couldn't have been happier. Even though her boyfriend lived over 20 hours away, she was just ecstatic to have someone that she could be close with. But it didn't take long before things started to get, well, a bit unusual. Brandon was quickly becoming the main focus of Carly's life. Whatever the two were up to, the other person was immediately informed about it. They shared everything with one another. What I found particularly fascinating is that, as we all know, most teenage relationships don't last too terribly long, especially online relationships. But Carly and Brandon managed to keep their relationship going for more than 18 months, even though they'd never even met in person. After they'd been chatting for about a year or so, Brandon wanted to introduce Carly to his father, Shane, and he did this over a video call. As time rolled on, Carly started talking more and more about Shane. In fact, it didn't take long before Carly was talking about Shane just as much as she was talking about Brandon. This is when Sonia started to get a little bit concerned. She asked Carly why she suddenly had such an interest in Shane, and she explained that Brandon and Shane were incredibly close, much like Sonia and Carly were. Sonia reminded Carly to be careful, and Carly made it very clear that if anything started to get weird or uncomfortable, she would tell her mother right away. And for Sonia, this was enough to calm her fears, so she dropped it and let it be. Sonia would later learn that Shane had a job as a security guard, and this job caused him to travel for work events every so often. In February of 2007, he was traveling across Australia for one of these events, and on his way back home to Brisbane, he offered to stop by Carly and Sonia's home to drop off a few birthday gifts that he and Brandon had purchased for Carly the previous month. At first, Sonia thought this was a little bit strange, but when Shane showed up at the family's home, he was wearing his security guard outfit, so the story seemed to check out. Shane seemed to be exactly the man that he claimed to be. He was clean cut, professional, and nothing seemed unusual about him. In fact, Carly and Sonia felt so safe around him that they offered to let him spend the night at their home, inviting him to Carly's birthday party the following day. But while Shane was in town, he offered to take Carly shopping. Now, this, in my book, is definitely a bit strange. What would a 50-year-old man be doing taking a teenage girl shopping? Even if he was the father of her boyfriend, this seems a bit strange considering the two had only just met, and there's been no indication that Carly's mother was even present during their trip. But the following day, at Carly's birthday party, that's when things started to get really bizarre. When Shane showed up at Carly's birthday party, it was immediately clear that something strange was happening. 
When Carly's friends and family members started showing up, Shane started to get visibly uncomfortable. There wasn't any particular moment where you could point to and say, see that, that's weird. But Sonia started to notice that Shane, for lack of a better word, seemed possessive over Carly. It seemed almost as if Shane and Carly were glued at the hip. He didn't let her wander off too terribly far, and he hung around Carly throughout the entire party, rarely ever speaking to anyone other than her for more than a few simple sentences. But the following morning, that's when things really started to get weird. As soon as Sonia passed by Carly's bedroom, she noticed Shane and Carly were lying on Carly's bed. In one report, it was claimed that Shane was actually lying on top of Carly, and Carly was visibly uncomfortable. Sonia immediately sprang into action and told Shane that he needed to leave immediately. It doesn't seem like he put up too much of a fight either. He knew he'd been caught. He grabbed his things and left. As soon as he was gone, Carly revealed that he'd made a few passes at her and that she had repeatedly rejected his advances, insisting that she was in love with his son, not him. Carly then told her mother about the birthday presents that Shane had shown up with. Now, because of YouTube's terms of service, I can't really explain the full extent of these gifts, but let me just say, one of them was an outfit that no 50-year-old man had any business gifting to the girlfriend of his son. This was the moment that Sonia truly understood what was happening here. She made all the right moves in the coming days, taking away Carly's access to social media, banning her from using her cell phone, keeping a much closer eye on her online activity, and calling Shane and telling him that he was never allowed to speak to her daughter again or she'd report him to the police. Mind you, this all may sound a bit harsh, but this wasn't done as a way to punish Carly in any way. This was all done in a bid to keep Carly safe. And based on Sonia's statements since then, it seems like she likely did a good job explaining this to Carly. It's awful that Carly lost so many of her freedoms because of this guy, but when it comes to the safety of your child, all bets are off. You do what you have to do. But the problem is that, well, we've all been teenagers at some point. We all know that regardless of what your parents tell you to do, if you want to do something, you'll find a way to do it. And Carly wasn't willing to let Brandon go. She admitted that what happened with Shane was pretty insane, but Brandon wasn't to blame for this. No sooner than her mother forbade her from speaking with Brandon, Carly was right back up to her old antics, speaking to Brandon every chance she could get. Only this time, she was keeping it a secret, and her mother had no idea. A few weeks passed by, and it was February 19th, 2007, when Carly told her mother that she was going to be spending a night out with a group of her friends. She got dressed up in her best outfit, then headed for the front door. But strangely, Sonia says that it was at this moment that Carly's behavior began to change. She turned to her mother and asked her for a hug, then another, then another, and another. It was almost as if she was afraid to leave. Her demeanor had changed without any rhyme or reason. Sonia didn't really know what this was all about, but what kind of mother would turn away hugs from her daughter? Carly's last words to her mother before she left were simply, love you, mom. The door closed and Carly was never seen again. Carly never returned home from her outing with her friends that evening. When she still hadn't shown up by the following morning, Sonia knew something had gone terribly wrong. And that's when she called the police to report her daughter missing. Every parent's worst nightmare. But for Sonia, her nightmare was about to get far, far worse. Sonia would be subjected to something that no parent should ever have to face. As she was pacing around her home, pleading for some sort of news about her daughter, she heard a knock at the door, followed by two police officers with sullen expressions. As we all know, this never means anything good. Carly had been found, but not the way her mother had hoped. Investigators revealed that early that morning, detectives had come across a victim who'd been floating in Horseshoe Bay. That victim was identified as Carly Ryan. When she was taken in for further forensic analysis, it was determined that Carly had endured at least 19 injuries before she lost her life, each of which was more haunting, heartbreaking, and heinous than the last. Security cameras and witness reports would soon reveal that Carly was last seen on the beach in the Horseshoe Bay area at around 9.30 the previous evening. She was in the company of what appeared to be two men, but it would later come to light that this had been one man and a teenage boy. They had arrived in the area in a blue vehicle, and it was this vehicle description that was used to track them down later on. As it would turn out, the two males who were seen in the CCTV security footage were none other than Shane and Brandon. Except that's not entirely true. See, 
that's because Shane and Brandon, they didn't exist. 11 days after Carly was discovered in Horseshoe Bay, police closed in on Gary Francis Newman, as well as his teenage son. His teenage son has never been named due to laws in Australia that prevent the names of young offenders from being revealed. It would quickly become clear, though, that Gary was, in fact, both Shane and Brandon. He'd created an alter ego online to lure teenage girls and cause them to fall in love with him faking interest in everything they loved and stalking them both online and in the real world. What makes this situation so much worse is that Gary had either convinced or forced his teenage son to play a part in the scheme as well. Considering there's virtually zero information available about Gary's son, we don't know if he was a willing accomplice or just as much a victim as Carly was. Basically, Gary was the one who was chatting with Carly for more than a year online. But any time he needed to schedule a video call with Carly, he would ask his son to step in to make things more realistic. All the photos that had been shared between the two were also of his own son. When Shane, or Gary, was forced to leave Carly's home after being caught lying in her bed, he was understandably upset. After all, he'd been concocting this plan for more than a year and a half, and in the blink of an eye, it was all over. But he couldn't let this be the end. He needed to see Carly one final time and this time he would bring his teenage son along to help finish the job. Carly was lured out of her home that evening under the promise of finally being able to meet her online boyfriend in person for the first time. She lied to her mother and explained that she would be going out with friends, but in reality, she was due to hang out with her boyfriend, or so she thought. The thing is, Carly knew that something was fishy about this situation. She had seen all the red flags, her mother had warned her about both Shane and Brandon, but she chose to risk it all anyway. We know that Carly knew about the potential dangers because of how apprehensive she was to leave her home that evening. Her mother knew something was a bit off too, but considering Carly lied about her intentions that evening, there was little her mother could do, as she was blissfully unaware of the level of danger her daughter was about to place herself in. Now, don't think for one second that I'm blaming this on Carly. She was never anything more than a victim of this awful, heartless monster. I merely bring up the fact that she ignored all the obvious signs of danger as a warning to parents or teenagers that when your gut tells you something's unsafe, it's probably because it's unsafe. If you smell smoke, there's probably a fire. We've been given the gift of gut feelings for a reason, and you should pretty much always trust them. But if you could imagine, this story is about to get a whole lot worse. If you remember, it was nearly two weeks after Carly was found in Horseshoe Bay that Gary's home was finally raided by the police. When detectives showed up at his home, Gary was actually in the middle of chatting up another teenage girl online. When his home was searched and investigators combed through every square inch of his place, they found a notebook that had documented at least 200 different aliases that Gary had been using online. From what I can tell, he used this notebook to help keep his story straight so that his victims wouldn't see right through his charade. Brandon and Shane had been just two of the names, less than 1% of his total list of characters. In his notebook, investigators found names, ages, occupations, interests, everything that related to each and every one of these characters that he had created. If you consider that Gary used two aliases when speaking with Carly, that means that he could have had another 100 victims, assuming he pulled the whole father-son card for each of them. In reality, this number of victims could be substantially higher. There's just no way to know for sure. This notebook was also a gold mine for investigators because it even documented usernames and passwords for each of his fake online profiles, giving them every last piece of evidence that they needed to get this man behind bars. But we have to remember that putting someone behind bars does little to help calm the pain of the family who are now left with one less person at the dinner table each night. Worse yet, in Sonia's case, she's now left with no one at her dinner table each night. Sonia's world ended the day that she lost her daughter. Her purpose, her goals, her ambitions, they're gone, and she can never get them back. Thankfully, Gary was sentenced to life in prison. Unfortunately, though, he still will be eligible for parole after 29 years. But considering he was 50 when this crime took place, the man will likely be 80 before he ever has the slightest chance of seeing natural sunlight again. Though we can all hope that this day never comes for Gary. 
In the wake of Gary's sentencing, Gary's ex-wife came out and explained why the two had gotten divorced many years before this. She explained that Gary had been shockingly aggressive towards her, assaulting her multiple times, forcing her against her will on many occasions. When he then started turning his attention towards their own teenage daughter, that's when she knew that she needed to get herself and their three children out of there. Unfortunately, this wasn't even a wake-up call for Gary. He would later adopt a son of his own, the one that he used in his online schemes, and he simply repeated the cycle. After all was said and done, Gary's son was cleared of all charges, which pretty much secures the idea that his son was likely just as much a victim as Carly was. In the aftermath of such a tragedy, Sonia felt that she needed to do something, anything, to help parents whose children may end up in similar situations. This led her to form the Carly Ryan Foundation, a foundation that offers certified online safety programs and conducts regular seminars to help educate children and parents about the dangers of online predators. If this wasn't enough, Sonia was also able to establish Carly's Law, an Australian law that allows prosecutors to both charge and convict online predators before they ever lay a hand on a child. They can do this by establishing intent based on chat logs, as well as convict an adult who misrepresents their age to a minor. This law has already saved so many lives, and Sonia was the driving force behind this law every step of the way. If not for her, there's no telling how many other children may have ended up just like Carly. If you're a parent, or even if you're a teenager, I would strongly urge you to visit CarlyRyanFoundation.com to better understand everything that the foundation has to offer. The resources page has heaps of valuable information that's been updated for modern times to help keep kids safe on more modern platforms, such as Roblox, Fortnite, and the various other social media or gaming platforms that are predominantly aimed towards children. There's nothing that any of us can do to bring Carly back, but if Sonia has it her way, every child across the globe will become better educated about internet safety so that stories like this will one day be a thing of the past. No one should ever have to go through what Carly and Sonia dealt with. And it's our job, you and me, it's our job to keep these kids safe. A detective's daughter isn't someone you would expect to become caught up in a true crime story. But in the case of Georgia Williams, that's exactly what happened. Now, Georgia wasn't this criminal's first victim, but investigators ensured she was certainly his last. Georgia was lured to the home of someone she felt completely comfortable around, someone she felt she could trust more than anyone else in the world. But this notion of trust was quickly shattered when Georgia realized she was in for a lot more than she bargained for. Georgia was subjected to what was likely hours upon hours of unspeakable terror, unlike anything you could imagine. What should have been a calm evening between friends turned into the stuff of nightmares. Georgia Williams was born on a cool day in mid-September back in 1995 in Shropshire, England. She had a sister who was a bit older than her, and the two would grow up in the home of their parents, Lynette and Steve Williams, with Steve being a detective. Georgia is remembered for being a very lively girl that was always full of energy, someone who could make friends with darn near anyone, the type of person many of us aspire to be. Growing up in her younger years, though, Georgia didn't always have it easy. When she was in middle school, she began to be bullied quite a lot. Thankfully, this bullying didn't last very long, and after enduring a few years of aggravation and pain, high school rolled around. And that's when things really began to take shape for Georgia. By the time she reached the age of 16 or 17, Georgia's luck had completely turned around. And not only was she now considered to be one of the popular girls, but she was eventually elected head girl of her class. Now, for anyone who may not be familiar with this term, myself included, that's basically the British equivalent of being class president, a single student who the others have elected to be the lead voice of the entire student body. Needless to say, Georgia had a pretty prosperous time in high school, and when her schooling finally began to wind down when she turned 17, she revealed that she planned on continuing her education so that she could become an Air Force paramedic, an incredibly noble position to aim for. In order to make these dreams a reality, though, she needed to fund her future education. And to do this, she opted to get a job at a local gas station. After beginning work at the gas station, 
Georgia made friends incredibly quickly. It didn't take long before she was on good terms with every member of staff. But there was one guy in particular who Georgia took an interest in. She noted that he was incredibly shy and didn't really hang out with the rest of the team, but she wanted to change that. Knowing all too well how it felt to be an outcast in her younger years, Georgia made sure to take time with this guy to make sure he felt welcomed and accepted. This man would be Jamie Reynolds, who was about 22 years old at the time. Georgia went out of her way to make sure Jamie was invited to all of the coworkers' get-togethers and gatherings. While he wasn't the type of person to really be seen in a social or a public setting, well, things quickly changed. As soon as he began hanging out with Georgia, it was like his entire personality changed. While he'd previously been reserved, awkward, and shy, his confidence had finally come to the surface. It was clear that there was a deep bond developing between the two, but it seems like they weren't really on the same page. As you probably have come to expect, before long, Jamie had fallen head over heels for Georgia. But there was one problem. She didn't really feel the same way about it. Jamie ended up asking Georgia out on a couple of dates, but she turned him down and explained that she wasn't really looking for a boyfriend at the moment. She was more focused on making her career dreams a reality. And she explained to him in the gentlest way that she could that she just wanted to be friends. Jamie was understandably upset about this, but he made it clear that he completely understood why Georgia had turned him down. He took the letdown in stride and basically just let it go. Or so it seemed. As anyone who's been rejected knows, being turned down isn't always easy. Now, it's simple enough to let the situation pass and move on with your life. But just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. Jamie understood this all too well, because this was one of the hardest things he'd ever done. It would seem that Georgia was one of the only people who was ever really willing to give Jamie the time of day, and he was terrified of letting her slip away. So he concocted a plan to make sure that would never happen. By the time Jamie turned 23, he and Georgia had been friends for the better part of a year. Feeling like he could confide in her, he'd spoken with Georgia multiple times about how unsatisfied he was with his life. He couldn't fathom the thought that the best life would ever be for him was working a job at a gas station. He wanted more, and who could blame him? Georgia spoke with him about what his dreams were, what his hobbies may have been, and what he wanted to do with his life. Jamie explained that one of the biggest passions of his was photography, and that's when Georgia suggested that he try taking up a job as a photographer, find some people to shoot photos for, maybe do weddings, things of that nature. Jamie loved this idea, so much so that he asked Georgia to help him establish a professional portfolio to show off his work. Not only this, but he asked Georgia to be his first model, and she jumped at the opportunity to help out her friend. The plan was for Georgia and a few others to head over to Jamie's house on May 26, 2013. They'd planned a huge photo shoot for that day so that Jamie would be able to get heaps of photos of various people to ensure his portfolio was as diverse as possible. The only problem was, Georgia would soon learn that her family had planned a big barbecue party that same day, and her grandparents would be coming to town for a short visit as well. Georgia did not want to miss this barbecue, but she also didn't want to let Jamie down. She knew that the two only lived about four or five minutes apart, so she decided to get dressed up and go do the photo shoot, then hurry home afterwards so that she could spend time with her grandparents. She did her hair, put on jeans and a leather jacket, and then took off. It would be around 7.30 that evening when Georgia headed off towards Jamie's house. Her family expected her to be back within a fairly short amount of time, maybe 30 minutes to an hour or so, but when three full hours had passed by, they started to get a bit concerned. They weren't worried or anything, but they couldn't understand what had been taking so long. Her mother ended up texting her to make sure everything was going okay, and Georgia explained that they'd finished the photo shoot quite a while ago and that she'd been hanging out with friends there and she simply lost track of time. Georgia explained that she would probably not be home until fairly late that night, letting them know not to wait up for her. With that, her parents turned in for the night, but they had no idea that the person they'd been texting, it wasn't Georgia. By the following morning at 6.30 a.m., Georgia's mother quickly realized that Georgia still hadn't returned home. 
This is when things really began to become bizarre, because her mother knew that Georgia had a music festival scheduled later that day, and she wouldn't miss it for the world. She'd been planning on attending for weeks. Her parents assumed that she'd probably just be heading off to the festival from her friend's house, so again, they didn't put too much thought into it. After all, Georgia had never been the type of person to get into trouble, so they assumed she had it all figured out, as she always did. By later that evening, though, they started to get suspicious. See, Georgia didn't have her driver's license just yet, and she was taking driving classes before actually taking her test to ensure that she knew the ins and outs of everything. Her classes were scheduled to take place early the next day, so her parents expected her to return home later that evening, but she never did. They waited up late that night, expecting her to come home at any moment, but they never heard a word from her. She also stopped responding to texts and calls. By late that evening, her parents had taken to calling friends, family, anyone who may have seen Georgia, but no one had. When Georgia still hadn't returned home the next morning and eventually missed her driving lesson, that's when her parents called the police to file a missing person report. When police showed up at the Williams home later that day to take their statements, they asked all the usual questions, including when they'd last seen their daughter and where she was supposed to have been. Her parents explained that the last they knew, she'd headed off to a photo shoot at her friend Jamie's house. Admittedly, this wasn't much information to work with, but the obvious first step was to look into Jamie and see what he may know about her disappearance. But as officers began to look up information in their database about Jamie, they were shocked, to say the least. As they brought up Jamie's profile in their system, they quickly learned that Jamie was caught by officers back in 2008 for attempting to claim the life of a teenage girl. The crazy thing is, the police didn't actually arrest him, nor was he charged with a single crime. Now, I'm sure there's more to the story than what's been reported, but this definitely seems bizarre to me. In the end, Jamie was just given a warning and was allowed to walk away without any repercussions, while this innocent girl was left with lifelong trauma. This seems utterly nuts to me, but again, I feel like there has to be more to the story than this. Surely the police weren't this negligent. But the truth is, maybe they were. Thankfully, investigators weren't willing to take Georgia's case so lightly. They knew now that Jamie had a history of violence, so they began the hunt for Georgia, firing on all cylinders. They showed up at Jamie's door and knocked, but received no response. Desperate for answers, they didn't waste any time. They kicked down his door and forced their way inside. They searched every inch of the home, but didn't find any signs of Jamie. They immediately sent out calls for help, and Jamie was now considered to be a wanted man. Detectives first went to the gas station where Jamie and Georgia worked, but none of their co-workers had seen them in days and both of them had missed their shifts. This was not good news. They tracked down details of Jamie's van and sent out information to all available officers to be on the lookout for the vehicle. After searching the ends of the earth for any sign of him, officers eventually tracked him down more than 200 miles away in Scotland of all places. This man hadn't just skipped town, he fled the country entirely. This was all the info police needed to know that Jamie was up to something. But what was it? When police questioned him about Georgia, he quickly pulled the I don't know card and left it at that, insisting he had no knowledge of where Georgia went after the photo shoot that day. Investigators weren't having any of it. They detained him and transported him all the way back to Shropshire for a proper interrogation. But the news that he would reveal well, it wasn't anything that George's family wanted to hear. Police were now highly suspicious of Jamie. In fact, the text messages that George's family had received on the night that she went missing, now these were getting called into question as well, as Jamie may have been the one to send them. Considering he had a history of assault and was found while fleeing the country, police now had enough evidence to search his home for clues about Georgia. They didn't know how he was involved in her disappearance, but they felt highly confident, at the very least, that he knew more than he was letting on about Georgia. As they searched his home, they managed to track down the camera that he'd been using on the day of the photo shoot. Lucky for them, the SD card was still inside the camera, too. The only problem was the card had been completely wiped. Not a single photo remained. But investigators weren't going to let this stop them. 
Detectives brought the SD card to their digital forensics team, and without much issue, the team was able to recover all of the deleted photos. See, when you delete a photo off of something like an SD card or a hard drive, those photos aren't actually deleted. To put it in super simple terms, they basically just be moved to a hidden folder where they'll just sit there and wait until that space is needed for other files, then they'll be gradually deleted one by one. You could think of it as throwing something in the trash, but not taking the trash out. Yes, the trash is out of your way, but until it gets taken to the dump, it's easy enough to just take things back out of the bin. That's basically how these photos were recovered. When forensic specialists managed to recover the photos, nothing could prepare them for what they had found. Turns out Jamie did have a photo shoot that day, but he and Georgia were the only ones in attendance. Unbeknownst to Georgia, no one else had ever even been invited. The photo shoot began like any regular photo shoot. There were various photos of Georgia looking happy, smiling, and posing. But all of a sudden, the tone of the images shifted. Soon, Georgia's clothes were missing. Things only got worse from here, as the next few photos show Georgia with a rope hanging loosely around her neck with a very concerned, terrified expression on her face. The next few photos, well, they were worse. It was incredibly clear that Georgia was being held against her will. What was even more clear is that between two of the photos, things took a tragic turn and Georgia had now lost her life. Immediately after Georgia's life had been taken, Jamie continued to take hundreds of other photos, literally hundreds, of her in various poses at different angles, so on and so forth. I truly can't get into all of the details of what these photos showed, but it was unlike anything you could ever imagine. This was horrendous, and that's putting it so, so lightly. Police continued to search Jamie's home, and that's when they found, in addition to the photos of Georgia, a minimum of 16,800 photos that showed incredibly violent acts being carried out on various people. Detectives don't believe Jamie took all of these photos himself if he took any of them at all, but simply possessing them was a crime. There were also 72 graphic videos that were found as well, and again, each was more and more violent than the one before it. Considering Jamie was still living with his parents when all of this came to light, his parents were asked to speak with officers to give their side of the story, hoping they could shed some light on the situation and explain how all of this had taken place and how Jamie managed to get a hold of these photos and videos. What his parents told the police was downright shocking because what police had found in Jamie's room, it was nothing new. In fact, his parents had known about it for the better part of a decade. When all of this was taking place, the photo shoot, the crime, and everything in between, Jamie's parents had been out of town on vacation. But as soon as they got the call from investigators about Jamie's arrest, they rushed back home as quickly as they could. When police confronted the couple about what they'd found in Jamie's room, their jaws hit the floor. See, they knew about Jamie's, well, fantasies, to put it lightly, they knew that he'd been watching violent sexual videos for quite some time. When the police pressed them about this issue, Jamie's parents admitted they'd first caught Jamie watching videos like this when he was just 14 years old. After this discovery, his parents reached out to their internet provider and had them block access to these websites. But it's pretty much all that was ever said about the situation. To make matters worse, I feel the need to clarify that this is simply when his parents caught him watching these videos. That doesn't mean it was the first time he'd ever done it. Truth be told, he could have been watching stuff like this since he was in middle school. We just don't know. But here's where things get crazy. When Jamie found out that his parents had blocked access to these websites, he actually called the internet provider himself and paid for his own private internet connection. His parents were none the wiser. Each month, he would pay the bill with his own money, and his parents never had a clue. When his parents did eventually find out about his private internet access, they decided to call the police as well as Child Protective Services. From what I've gathered, neither of these parties did anything to actually fix the situation. I found one report that claimed that possessing these videos isn't even illegal in England, but I personally find that hard to believe. If these videos were as violent as some sources suggest they are, then they may have been documenting actual crimes, which in fact is a crime in and of itself, at least here in the States. I feel it's safe to assume that this would be a crime in England as well, but I may be wrong. But regardless, no one did anything about it. 
Jamie wasn't willing to obey his parents, and despite their constant complaining, he made it very clear that he was going to do what he wanted to do, and there was nothing they could do to stop it. Jamie continued to grow up surrounded by this incredibly damaging content, and needless to say, it had a profound effect on him in his later years, as is evidenced by this very case. When police continued searching Jamie's home after his arrest, they managed to track down at least 40 separate notepads on which Jamie had written stories and fantasies about what he wanted to do to Georgia, as well as various other women. Now, these weren't your typical fan fiction type stuff that you'd find on the internet. No, these were highly detailed, incredibly graphic stories about what he planned to do to a woman if he was ever given the opportunity. Each of these stories ended the same way, with the females losing their lives. As police combed through each and every one of these stories, they found one that caught their eye. It was titled Georgia Williams in Surprise. The story documented in explicit detail exactly what happened to Georgia that day. It was like a play-by-play -play of the crime. According to one article, police say that he began writing the story in January and finished writing it just a few weeks before the crime actually unfolded. When police confronted Jamie about this story, he didn't budge. He continued to claim that he was innocent and was 100% uncooperative with the investigation. This meant police had to resort to good old-fashioned detective work to figure out what exactly had happened to Georgia and where she was now. Their investigation first began at a gas station nearby. It's unclear if this is the same station where the two had worked or if this was a different station entirely. Jamie was caught on CCTV here, filling up his van with gas. It's believed that at this very moment, Georgia had already been stowed away in the back of the vehicle. Immediately after getting gas, he drove to a nearby movie theater and watched a movie, all while Georgia was still in the back of the van, just leaving her there for hours while he laughed it up inside the theater. Police weren't sure where he went after this, but a few witnesses later reached out and explained that they'd seen that exact van driving through a mountain road in North Wales. As it would turn out, while driving through the area, Jamie's van got stuck in the mud, and a few people actually helped him get his van unstuck and back onto the road. All the while, Georgia was likely still in the back. This is what led police to head to the woods where the van was stuck and check out the surrounding area. Sure enough, in the thick brush of the woods, they found Georgia's body, tossed amongst the trees like some animal. It should go without saying that at his trial a short while later, Jamie was found guilty. Interestingly, he'd been proclaiming his innocence all the way up until the very day of the trial. Then, as he stood before the court, he finally changed his tone and pleaded guilty. He was the youngest person in English history to be given a life sentence with no possibility of parole. In the wake of the trial, it came to light, not only did the police fail the public back in 2008 when Jamie tried to take the life of that teenage girl, but various other institutions also failed to properly get this man off the streets. A mental health nurse made a public statement in which she said that she knew about Jamie's violent behavior years before the trial. She recalled a series of photos that Jamie had drawn, presumably when he was a child, each of which depicted a woman with a rope hanging around her neck. According to this nurse, nothing was done about this and the situation just faded away. Now, she didn't say this part outright, but her verbiage led me to believe that she may have attempted to speak with investigators about this, but it didn't really go anywhere if so. By this point, Jamie's parents were also well aware of his violent tendencies, having caught him watching the aforementioned videos on multiple occasions. His parents did everything they knew how to do, but outside of kicking Jamie outside of their house, what can you do if your child just outright refuses to cooperate? Now, I suppose he could have been involuntarily admitted somewhere, and surely if his parents knew just how bad this behavior was, they would have explored that. But the truth is, this case can't just be blamed on one person. Jamie isn't the only one responsible. If he'd gotten the help he needed when he was younger, it's likely that none of this would have ever happened. And I'm not blaming his parents for this by any means. From the reports I've read, they legitimately did their best. The mental health nurse that he saw also seems to have done her best to bring awareness to the situation, and the poor teenager who he attacked also seems to have done her part. But the investigative teams at each of these institutions just fail. There's no other way to explain it. Let this be a lesson to parents everywhere. Take note of what your children are doing on the internet, what content they watch, what games they play, who they're speaking to. 
Cases like this don't have to happen. Stories like this don't have to be told. If something seems a bit weird, chances are it's because it's weird. If your kid is watching something you don't understand, take the time to understand it and make an educated judgment call. If you catch your child repeatedly watching content like this, it's your job to go as far as you need to to keep them safe. Cancel your internet entirely if you have to. Take their phone, their computer, tablet, whatever it is, and throw that junk in the trash if that's what it takes. I don't, I don't care what it costs. We're all responsible for the children in our lives, even if they're not our own. It's our job to keep these children safe and keep tabs on them until they're old enough to make good decisions on their own. If something strange is going on with your kid, it is never too early to reach out to a professional for help. There's no shame in it either. It doesn't make you a failed parent or a guardian if you learn that your kid needs more help than you can provide. What makes you a failed parent or guardian is if you're unwilling to reach out and admit when both you and your kid need help. Ultimately, in Jamie's situation, his parents didn't know just how disturbed he really was. And his parents reached out to the police and mental health experts, but sadly, that still wasn't enough because their cries fell on deaf ears. I don't know who to think is responsible for this, but I do feel with every ounce of my being that this could have been avoided. It didn't have to end this way. Rachel Barber was 15 years old in 1999 when she went missing after a dance recital. She was last seen alongside her babysitter that afternoon, but investigators found no trace of her after this. But detectives did find a disturbing diary entry written just days before she vanished in which her babysitter confessed to what really happened that day. Rachel Barber was born on September 12, 1983. She was the oldest of three sisters and had parents who were deeply involved in her life, doing their best to provide her with everything she could have ever wanted. Her mother, Elizabeth, and her father, Michael, had been together for many years, and Rachel's home life was the very definition of healthy and typical for a girl her age. Sometime around 1992 or 1993, Rachel and her family moved to Mont Albert, hoping for better opportunities. It was around this time that the family met a young girl named Carolyn Reed Robertson. Carolyn quickly became a friend of the family, with Rachel's parents often hiring her to help babysit the children. Carolyn would grow up alongside Rachel and her siblings, but she was around four years older and certainly more mature than the young Barber girls were at the time. Rachel was just 15 years old by 1999. She spent much of her childhood training to become a dancer, and she was incredibly talented. Not only was she a great dancer, but she aspired to be a model as well. Her goal in life was to eventually enter acting classes and work her way into musicals across the globe, particularly musicals in the US, as most of her favorite venues and performances were taking place in Chicago. Rachel had become a full-time student at the Dance Factory in Melbourne, Australia. She was known for her beauty as well as her popularity and her athleticism. She was in great shape and was often in the top of her class, becoming a world-class dancer at a strikingly young age. While Rachel may have been quite popular in school, she was actually a quite shy young girl. She didn't take too well with strangers and would often seem withdrawn around people that she didn't know very well, but she was always very nice and respectable. Even though she was quite shy, Rachel had been dating her boyfriend Manny for several months and it seemed that the two were closer than ever. Despite her timid nature, she had no problems opening up to Manny, who seemed to make it easy for Rachel to just be herself. Carolyn Robertson, the babysitter I mentioned a moment ago, was right there alongside the Barber family for about seven years or so. She watched Rachel turn from a shy young girl into a vibrant young woman who was bound for success in her dance career. Carolyn adored Rachel, but she had other feelings towards Rachel that were less than loving. Carolyn was a very jealous teenager. She had trouble dealing with other people's successes, especially considering that, in all honesty, she didn't have much going for her at the time. She was a perfectly good-looking girl, but she didn't have the magnetic energy and charisma that Rachel had, and this bothered Carolyn deeply. As she watched over the girls for most of their childhood, it seemed that this resentment toward Rachel grew. 
what had begun as a simple feeling of jealousy, something all of us struggle with from time to time, grew to something far more dangerous and far more sinister. Carol had wanted to live Rachel's life, and if she couldn't live it, neither could Rachel. Carolyn's troubles with self-worth and jealousy would reach new heights as her teenage years drew on. By the time she was in her mid-teens, she began to feel horrible about herself, and not just in the typical way that most teens will at some point or another, it seems that by all means she had begun to develop a genuine hatred toward herself. She didn't look the way that she wanted to look, she didn't feel smart enough, and she certainly didn't feel worthy of being loved. According to those around her, she'd always put herself down, referring to herself as a loser, as unwanted, fat, dirty, or even dumb. In fact, she created a self-portrait around the age of 14 that had several of these words written on it, with misfit being written in bold letters at the very top. Carolyn was reaching an all-time low, and it was happening quickly. But as she got a little bit older, some of this hate turned away from herself and was beginning to surround her father this being after her father walked out on the family, leaving Carolyn and the rest of her loved ones to fend for themselves while her dad started a new, better life elsewhere. Carolyn would take her anger and write it down in letters to her estranged father. I don't know if she ever mailed these letters or if they were purely therapeutic, but the letters grew very vicious, with her one time blaming her father for her feelings of alienation, writing, quote, I feel like a troubled, tortured, lost soul that's been thrown into an alien environment full of angels. These terrible feelings of self-hatred that Carolyn held on to would eventually lead her to plotting a crime of disastrous proportions. Her anger and rage would soon be taken out on someone who didn't really have anything to do with her situation, Rachel Barber. It was March 1st, 1999. Rachel's father drove her to a tram stop that morning around 9.30 a.m. so that she could attend her classes at the dance factory in Melbourne. She left home wearing her favorite gold necklace, having only $13 in her wallet. She told her boyfriend Manny that after classes, she was going to head out for a secret job offer that she wasn't allowed to talk about. The sheer fact that she even mentioned the job to Manny was against the rules, but she felt like he needed to know. This secret job was supposedly to pay incredibly well, but this was the only information that she was willing to share with anyone. She left the dance factory that afternoon, headed off for this secret location. Her parents had no idea that she had any other plans after classes that day, outside of hanging out with her friends as she normally did. The last reported sighting of Rachel came just after she left the dance factory, when she was spotted walking around a tram station with a woman. Hours passed by and Rachel had not returned to the tram station to meet her father that evening, and her parents grew very worried. Rachel had never missed curfew before, and she was reported missing right away. Manny quickly opened up to Rachel's parents and the police and admitted that she told him about a secret job offer, but he didn't know anything else about this job, so this information wasn't very helpful with the investigation. By all means, Rachel simply vanished off the face of the earth, and no further updates would be released until 13 days later, when some shocking news would leave the Barber family in shambles. It was March 14th when police approached the Barber family with news that they could have never expected. Keep in mind, at this point, the Barbers had no idea that police were investigating the case as a potential homicide. So you can imagine their surprise when officers knocked on the door of the Barber family home and revealed that they had arrested a suspect in connection with Rachel's disappearance. When police revealed that the suspect was none other than Carolyn Robertson, their jaws hit the floor. Carolyn had been a close family friend for the better part of a decade, so how could she have been involved in Rachel's disappearance? Unfortunately, the follow-up statements from detectives only made things far worse. Carolyn had been arrested because police had found remains buried in a shallow grave near Kilmore, and they had evidence connecting Carolyn to the scene of the crime. Investigators would soon learn that Rachel had been ambushed with a telephone cord, then buried under less than 12 inches of dirt. One of the most unexpected twists in this case came after police brought Carolyn to the station for questioning. It didn't take them long to get Carolyn to open up, and she admitted to everything. Well, almost everything. 
Within a few short hours, Carolyn admitted that she had, in fact, taken the life of Rachel Barber. But she claimed it was an accident. Carolyn says that she met up with Rachel that day shortly after her classes had ended. I'll admit, I don't fully understand the specifics of what Carolyn was explaining here, but the best I can make out is that she explained to police that she'd convinced Rachel to come to her apartment for some sort of psychological exercise, but it's not clear why Rachel thought this was a job offer or why she thought she'd be receiving any payment for this. Now, the rumor is that Carolyn had invited Rachel over and promised her $500 to take part in a highly confidential survey of some sort. But this was only mentioned in one source, so I can't verify that this is true. But either way, Carolyn explained that the two rode the tram together, then got out at her apartment after promising Rachel that she'd have pizza and drinks ready for them. And sure enough, when Rachel entered the apartment, pizza and drinks were ready. But Rachel was blissfully unaware that Carolyn had spiked the pizza with high doses of antihistamines, causing Rachel to become more and more delirious the more she ate. After Carolyn was satisfied with Rachel's impairment, she began her attack. She told Rachel that she was ready to begin the psychological survey, asking Rachel to close her eyes and think of happy and pleasant thoughts. As soon as Rachel was lost in a dream state, Carolyn ambushed her from behind with a telephone cord. Carolyn then stuffed Rachel inside of a wardrobe, keeping her there for several days while she worked out the next steps in completing the crime. She would eventually wrap Rachel in two rugs and enlisted the help of an innocent taxi driver to help her move what she called a heavy statue to her father's property. Obviously, what the taxi driver helped her haul away was no statue. But once the two arrived at Carolyn's father's house, Carolyn took the so-called statue out to the back of the property. And after the taxi driver left, she buried the remains in the family's pet cemetery next to Carolyn's former dog, Lucy. In the days after Rachel Barber had gone missing, Carolyn became very withdrawn from her normal activities. She went to work the day after the crime, March 2nd, but one of her coworkers ended up driving her home after Carolyn reportedly looked very ill and wasn't able to function well enough to get her job done. Carolyn would call out of work for the next few days as well, claiming that she was sick. During this time, investigators were hot on the trail of Carolyn, tracing Rachel's last moments and getting witness testimonies from everyone who had seen her at the tram station that day. As they dug into phone records, they soon noticed that Rachel had spoken with Carolyn on the day of her disappearance. In fact, she'd spoken with her within hours of her last known whereabouts, meaning Carolyn may have been the last person to see Rachel alive. Witnesses from the tram station also reported that they'd seen Rachel walking alongside a quote, plain looking young woman. Detectives went to Carolyn's apartment on March 12th, but they weren't getting any response at the door, even though they knew that Carolyn was inside. They eventually made their way into Carolyn's apartment and found her unconscious on her bedroom floor. They soon learned that she had suffered an epileptic seizure, which had likely been caused by the severe stress that she'd been under while trying to hide Rachel's body. While inside the apartment, they searched through Carolyn's belongings and soon came across her diary. Now, if you've been watching true crime stories for the last few weeks, you'll know that this is the third case I've covered in less than a month where the criminal was found because either they or the victim kept a detailed diary of events leading up to the crime. I don't know how so many of these cases ended up leading to the exact same situation, but that's exactly what happened here as well. When investigators took a closer look at Carolyn's diary, they realized that she'd been deeply obsessed with Rachel. And certainly not in a playful way or in any sort of innocent infatuation, Carolyn had kept detailed records of Rachel's recent life, and had even written down several possible ways that she planned on taking Rachel's life. She scribbled several options down, with one of the options claiming that she planned on incapacitating Rachel, then placing her into an army bag and dumping her out in the middle of the woods somewhere. These clues were a bit too suspicious for investigators, and they soon began investigating Carolyn's recent movements, tracking down her connection with her father's property and the aforementioned taxi driver. Detectives were able to prove that Carolyn had been spending days, maybe even weeks, plotting to take Rachel's life and, in essence, become Rachel. This was only amplified when detectives later found an application for a copy of Rachel's birth certificate in Carolyn's apartment. 
This is likely why she tricked Rachel into thinking she was offering her a job, as it would have been the easiest way to get personal information about Rachel, including her social security number, ID cards, and everything else she needed. Well, everything except for her birth certificate, obviously. Alongside this application was documentation for a bank loan for $10,000, as well as detailed plans on what Carolyn had planned to do. Her plans for the day claimed that she needed to clean up her father's farm, including the area where she had placed Rachel in the pet cemetery. She also planned to secure the bank loan on the following Tuesday, as well as rent a moving van, dye her hair to match Rachel's, then thoroughly clean her house and carpet. She then planned to disappear and begin life under Rachel's name. By October of 2000, Carolyn was still in police custody. In a surprising twist, Carolyn had opened up to investigators and admitted to taking Rachel's life, even pleading guilty during her trial. She was ultimately given 15 years behind bars. During her court sessions, she explained how much she hated herself and wanted to be someone else, so much so that she was willing to go to great lengths to achieve this. She was diagnosed with a personality disorder just before the trial, with a judge claiming that she was a danger for anyone that she became fixated with. But what's really interesting about her time in prison is that she never once showed any kind of remorse for her actions. In fact, while she was in prison, she progressively made herself look more and more like Rachel. She began styling her hair differently. She appears to have lost weight and did her best to become the spitting image of Rachel, at least as much as she realistically could. Rachel's own mother even spoke out about the uncanny resemblance after Carolyn was released from prison in 2015, after fulfilling her sentence. Carolyn is now a mostly free woman. She still lives under the surveillance of the court system, but she's now allowed to continue on with her life, or rather, Rachel's life. While she never successfully claimed Rachel's identity, she's done her best in the years since to continue living in the shadow of Rachel, and her fixation doesn't seem to have faded over the last 23 years. Honestly, I don't understand how someone like this is allowed to live in the free world after there was such a massive amount of evidence proving that she'd been plotting this crime for years, but I guess the laws in Australia only allow the court system to do so much to someone so young. Thankfully, after all this, Rachel's memory is still very much alive in the minds of those who knew her. But unfortunately, one of those minds belongs to Carolyn Robertson. Alexis Rasmussen was invited to the home of Eric and Dee Millerberg one night in 2011, under the pretense of babysitting for the couple while they spent the night out. Alexis needed the extra money and knew the couple well, so she agreed. But Eric and Dee had no plans of heading out that evening, and instead subjected Alexis to a night of terror like nothing she could have ever imagined. This case is going to be very difficult to cover, but it's also a very important case to talk about. Alexis Rasmussen was, by every definition, your typical teenage girl. She was born in January of 1995, making her just 16 years old at the time of the crime in 2011. Alexis was a girl who seemed excited about what the future had in store for her. Some of her favorite hobbies included reading, dancing, and shopping, but more than anything, she loved hanging out with her friends. Alexis had a strong support system of girls her age, friends she could tell anything to. But Alexis's life was far from perfect. We don't know much about Alexis's home life or her relationship with her parents, but what we do know is that she had a brother that she loved dearly. The two would fight all the time, but not in any serious way. It was always your typical sibling rivalry and things rarely ever got out of hand. Alexis knew that she had a family that cared about her deeply, and she knew she could depend on most of her family members when she needed them the most. But unfortunately, Alexis was battling demons that her parents never knew about. While she put on a front of being a happy-go-lucky teen girl with the world in the palm of her hand, she was hiding dark secrets unlike anything you could imagine a teenager going through. Alexis met Dee and Eric Millerberg in the spring of 2011. She'd been looking for a way to make some extra pocket money for when she went shopping with her friends, and she felt like babysitting would be a great way to make some extra cash. So when she found out that the Millerbergs were needing someone to watch over their children every once in a while, she jumped at the opportunity. It didn't take long for the Millerbergs to become close friends with Alexis. 
After all, she had a strong, likable personality, and the Millerbergs seemed like great people. But Alexis would soon learn that there was far more going on within the Millerberg family than she could have ever imagined. The problem is that Alexis looked up to the couple. Now, Alexis had parents who loved her dearly, and she seemed to have been well aware of her parents' love and support for her. But as I'm sure we all know, when you're a teen, you're looking for literally anyone to look up to except your parents. It's a time in life when you're doing your best to discover your own identity outside of your family and your parents. So Alexis dove headfirst into the Millerberg's lifestyle and friendship, feeling like she'd finally found a place where she truly belonged, a place where she could discover new things about herself and begin blossoming into an adult. She had a lot of respect for the Millerberg family, so she began spending more and more time with the couple. But what began as a simple babysitting opportunity quickly turned into much more, more than Alexis could have ever bargained for, and certainly more than Alexis's parents knew about. As it would turn out, even though Alexis looked up to the Millerbergs as role models, Eric and Dee were far from being model citizens. In fact, if you ask me, they proved themselves to be some of the worst people I've ever talked about on true crime stories, and you guys know that that's certainly saying a lot. Eric and Dee, in a span of about six months, would turn a beautiful 16-year-old girl into a shell of her former self. Alexis became someone her friends could barely recognize, losing all sense of self and purpose and becoming trapped in an addiction that few people are able to make it out of. Before I go any further, I need to make one thing clear, that the timeline of events and specifics of this case all come from testimonies given by the perpetrators, not the victim or her family. Alexis's family has been largely silent about this case, and that's to be expected. Her family was grieving a loss that most of us couldn't even fathom, so you can't blame them for just wanting to maintain their privacy. Unfortunately, that means that we don't have much clarity on certain aspects of the case, and we basically just have to take the Millerberg's word for it. So if any of you guys happen to have known Alexis's family or maybe lived in the area where this occurred, then feel free to clarify any details that may be inaccurate in the comments below. But according to the Millerbergs, after Alexis had babysitted for the family a handful of times, their relationship began to grow. Instead of only coming over to babysit, Alexis began coming over just to hang out with the family. It was during one of these visits that the Millerbergs offered Alexis alcohol. Keep in mind, Alexis was only 16 and the legal drinking age in the US is 21. Now, it's no secret that teens often end up finding alcohol at a much younger age anyway, but the Millerbergs openly offered it to Alexis on a regular basis. So she considered their home to be a place to get away from all the rules and regulations of her everyday life. It was a place where she could just hang out and be herself without being judged by everyone around her. Now, I'm sure most of us could get over the idea of alcohol, but the Millerbergs very quickly began upping the ante. Not only were they providing her with alcohol, but they soon began providing her with much harder numbing agents, the kind that you rarely come back from. Now, I'm not talking about the typical stuff that your uncle probably grows in the back of his garden. I'm talking about the stuff that you often hear about in trailer parks and whatnot when someone's house explodes in the middle of the night. The Millerbergs had quickly turned Alexis into an addict, a functioning one, but still an addict nonetheless. In fact, towards the end of her life, Alexis would begin accepting payment in the form of these substances rather than asking the couple for cash. These mind-altering experiences turned an innocent teenage girl into a fragment of the girl that she used to be. And soon enough, things got even worse, if you could possibly imagine such a thing. Now, I'm going to be very careful how to word this next statement, because it's not something most of us need to hear, but it is important in painting an accurate picture of Eric and Dee. I'm sure we all know that when you're married, there are certain aspects of your relationship that you want to keep behind closed doors. But in the Millerberg household, doors were always open, and anyone was allowed to join in. Sometimes it was even encouraged, and Alexis was around for all of this. To call this sickening would be a disservice to children everywhere. This, by all accounts, is maddening, and I can't wrap my head around how broken a human being must have been to be involved in something like this. But the worst is yet to come. It was September 10th, 2011. Alexis had been invited over to the Millerberg home because the couple needed to head out to go shopping for their daughter's birthday. 
But no sooner than Alexis arrived, plans changed. No babysitting or shopping ended up happening that day. Within minutes of Alexis arriving at the house, Eric offered her a mixed cocktail of various things. He injected her at least three times within a matter of minutes. Mind you, just a single injection would have been enough for a full-sized adult, but Alexis was rather small and still a teenager. Eric and Alexis then went to the bedroom for some private time away from Dee, but after a short while, Alexis's mind had begun to shift. She went from having the time of her life to feeling like she was living in a nightmare. Her thoughts began to spiral, and Dee says that she began to freak out. Before long, she was completely disoriented and it started to get extremely cold. Blankets and sheets weren't nearly enough, so she asked the Millerbergs if she could take a hot bath to try to get warm. After about 45 minutes, Dee came in to check on her and found that she was still cold. Dee helped her get out of the bath and wrapped her in a blanket, helping her lie down in another bedroom. The couple reportedly assumed that she would be fine and would snap out of it, but she never did. She only got colder and colder, but there wasn't much the Millerbergs could do for her, at least not in their eyes. After a short while, Eric and Dee stepped outside for a cigarette. They came back inside about 30 minutes later and found Alexis completely unresponsive. Dee was the only person who even remotely tried to help her. When she noticed Alexis wasn't breathing, she attempted to perform CPR, but it didn't help. The obvious choice here would have been to call 911 for help, but neither Dee nor Eric were prepared to do this. According to Dee, her first thought was that the two were going to lose their kids. Their lives, as they knew it, would essentially be over. They didn't feel like there was any hope for Alexis, so they never called anyone. What's really interesting about this decision is that Dee is a registered nurse, and Narcan would have been an obvious option. Narcan can be administered after an overdose like this, and most of the time, it can bring someone back from the brink. I've seen the miracles that it can work firsthand. Most ambulances keep it on hand for situations like this, so a simple 911 call would have almost certainly saved Alexis's life. But the Millerbergs weren't willing to do this. Instead, they let Alexis lose her life, cold, alone, and terrified. Police revealed later on that at the time of the crime, Eric was on parole for a prior burglary charge and a firearm charge. He was also known to be in a prison gang. Dee, on the other hand, had outstanding court dates after she was arrested for writing fraudulent prescriptions and for child endangerment charges. The seemingly clean-cut couple that Alexis had looked up to were very quickly turning out to be little more than thieves and criminals. Faced with the fact that in their eyes they had nowhere else to turn, the couple decided to stuff Alexis into a footlocker, later taking it out to the trunk of their car. They then left the home, leaving their six-year-old daughter behind unattended for hours. But thankfully, they took their toddler with them. Now, I say thankfully, but really, these two were driving all over the place higher than you could imagine, and a small child was in the back seat, and a body was in the trunk. There's really nothing to be thankful for here, so maybe thankfully isn't the best word to describe this situation, but at least the kid wasn't alone, though he may have been better off that way. The two eventually made their way to a remote patch of woods where they took Alexis out of the footlocker and dumped her body, face down in the dirt. They then covered her up with sticks, leaves, and dirt so that she couldn't easily be seen by passersby. The couple then drove to a dumpster and threw out Alexis's purse. They then drove to another dumpster and cut the carpet out of their car, trying to throw it away to remove any evidence that may have been left behind. They then drove home and acted like the whole thing never happened. After the couple finished up with one of the most disturbing crimes anyone could imagine, they moved on with their life. Meanwhile, the lives of the Rasmussen family were falling apart from every angle. Alexis's parents desperately waited for her to return home that day, but she never arrived. Obviously, before long, she was reported missing to the police, but there was absolutely no trace of her to be found. I'm not sure if her parents knew that she'd been heading over to babysit for the Millerberg family that day. Reports haven't really suggested where all police may have looked for her, but I would wager that her parents weren't aware of these plans, even though she planned on being out for several hours that day. What we do know is that Alexis had run away from home at least once before. So the family seems to have been operating under the assumption that she was just hiding out somewhere, likely with friends. No one would ever have expected such a heartbreaking scenario would have played out behind the family's back. The truth is, police likely would have never found out the truth if it hadn't been for one man, 
Eric Smith, also known as Peanut. According to the police, they had no idea that Alexis was in trouble or that she'd gotten involved with the wrong crowd. Peanut was a member of the same prison gang as Eric Millerberg, and there are varying accounts about how Peanut became involved in the crime. One source claims that Peanut was with Eric and Dee when they disposed of the evidence, but another source says that Peanut was simply told about the crime after it had happened. Either way, Alexis had been missing for more than a month. The crime had begun to weigh heavily on Peanut's mind. He knew how desperate Alexis's family must have been, and when he finally came forward, he told police that he wanted to reveal what had happened to Alexis to put her family at ease. He only requested that he be given immunity for keeping the crime a secret for so long, and police agreed to this. When they asked him why he suddenly had a change of heart, Peanut responded with one simple statement, saying, I also have a 16-year-old daughter. Peanut came clean to the police, revealing every last detail he had ever heard about the case. He even offered to lead police to the dump site. When the police rode out to the patch of woods, he took them directly to the area where Alexis had been left behind, finally bringing this nightmare to an end, at least for investigators. The truth is, for the Rasmussen family, the nightmare had only just begun. Police were quick to track down the Millerbergs, arresting them both and sending them to trial. The court case had a bit of a twist that I, for one, certainly didn't see coming. When Dee was asked about what had taken place that day, she responded that she was willing to open up about everything, but she wanted to be protected from her husband during the trial, and she wanted a lighter sentence in exchange for her cooperation. Her husband, on the other hand, wouldn't say a single word to investigators or detectives. Dee then turned her back on her husband and explained everything every last detail about the couple's relationship with Alexis, and the events that transpired on that fateful day in September. In exchange for her participation, Dee received a sentence of just five years in prison. Eric, on the other hand, didn't get off so lightly. You may be expecting that he was sent to prison for life, but he wasn't. Well, not really, anyway. Eric was found guilty of three major crimes homicide, obstruction of justice, and one charge for having relations with Alexis when she was still a teen. Even though Alexis technically consented to it, though she was obviously under the influence of who knows what, so consent is highly debatable. But one of these charges has a sentence of 1 to 15 years, another has a sentence of up to 5 years, and the final charge has a sentence of 5 years to life. The only problem is that Eric will be eligible for parole in 2046. While this may seem like a long way away, it's not. There isn't a sentence long enough for Eric, and a mere five years certainly isn't long enough for Dee either. In fact, Dee has already been released, and she's now a free woman. But the Rasmussen family will never be free. Nothing can ever bring back Alexis, and nothing could ever atone for the nauseating crimes that Eric and Dee committed. Alexis had such a bright and vibrant future ahead of her, but she lost it all because of these pathetic, repulsive monsters. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of True Crime Stories. After a story like this, just forget the usual outro. Let me know in the comments what you would do if you were left alone in a room with either of these two people. I'll see you next week. Melissa Jenkins was a school teacher and basketball coach from Vermont who went missing under mysterious circumstances in March of 2012. Thankfully, she was found within 24 hours of her disappearance. But unfortunately, her discovery would reveal a disturbing crime that was committed by two suspects who claim they were her friends. Melissa Jenkins was a 33-year-old single mother who, on the surface, seemed like your typical American woman. But in reality, she was far more than that. Melissa was truly one of the nicest women in her area, and she would do just about anything for anyone. Everyone in her community, both before and after her untimely passing, had nothing but nice things to say about her. She made a living by teaching at St. Johnsbury Academy in Vermont. St. Johnsbury is a private school, but it's considered a non-profit as well, giving it a leg up over some other schools of this nature. Melissa was one of the school's science teachers who was loved by all of her students. Every year, it seemed like students fought as hard as they could to land a place in her class. 
She was a great teacher who got on well with all of her students and made sure that each of them felt welcomed, heard, and cared for. She always had her students' best interest at heart and had a true passion for furthering the future generations. When she wasn't teaching science, she spent her time coaching the school's basketball team, coaching grades 9 through 12 as far as I can tell. Melissa knew that if her students were going to succeed, they not only needed a proper education, but they needed an extracurricular outlet as well, and she was more than willing to provide this for them. Not only was Melissa an amazing teacher and coach, but she was a great mother as well. We don't know much about what led Melissa to become a single mother, but we know that she had a two-year-old son who was the center of her world. Unfortunately, she needed to work two jobs to make ends meet, but she was happy to do so if it meant building a better life for her son. To make this happen, she would spend nights and weekends working as a waitress at a local restaurant. Considering Melissa spent almost every waking minute of her day either at work or in the public in some capacity, it became all the more shocking when she seemingly dropped off the face of the earth on March 25th, 2012. None of her friends were able to get in touch with her throughout that evening, and she'd been watching her two-year-old son that evening as well. So her boyfriend grew incredibly concerned for both the safety of Melissa and for her son. After several hours went by and he had still been unable to reach her or locate her, he decided to call 911. It was March 25th, 2012, when police received a call from Melissa's boyfriend. He explained that he'd received a call from Melissa earlier that night about a couple of friends of hers that were having car troubles. He explained that Melissa had offered to come help the friends out, but he never heard another word from her after this, despite dozens of phone calls. Her boyfriend continued by saying that he'd gone out looking for Melissa that evening, but he couldn't find any trace of her. But this is where things get pretty interesting. He explained that Melissa sounded strange when he spoke to her on the phone, but he didn't think much of it at the time. But he grew incredibly concerned when he found her car abandoned on Goss Hollow Road. This doesn't seem to have been a road that she would have normally traveled down. It was just a dirt road a short distance from her home. But her boyfriend couldn't figure out any reason that she would have been in this area at this time of night. When he approached her car, he realized it was still running. He looked in the windows, but there was no sign of Melissa. But then he noticed the most disturbing detail of all. Her son was still strapped into his car seat in the back of the car, all by himself. After telling police all of these details, investigators showed up within minutes. We don't know why the young boy wasn't given to his father, but he was sent to live with a family friend while police ironed out the details of what was going on. There were obvious signs of a struggle just outside of the car, including various shoe prints, scrapes, smudges, and unidentified tire tracks. A baseball hat was found on the ground near the front of the car, but it didn't belong to Melissa, and none of her friends or family recognized the hat. The tire tracks that were seen a short distance away looked as if the person driving the car had sped away in a hurry, but it was this next piece of evidence found near the tire tracks that made police all the more suspicious. They found Melissa's cell phone on the ground, crushed and rendered useless. Officers collected the phone for evidence, but there wasn't much information on the phone that proved to be beneficial to the investigation. By the time detectives had collected all of the evidence from the scene of the crime, it was beginning to get dark out, meaning their investigation met a new challenge. Regardless, police worked tirelessly through the night to collect every piece of evidence they could, but it seemed the suspects had managed to successfully leave the scene of the crime without leaving anything of significance behind, except for Melissa's two-year-old son. As it would turn out, he witnessed the entire struggle, and he was willing to tell the police everything he saw. As with most missing person cases, the first person detective suspected of the crime was Melissa's boyfriend. Police interviewed the boyfriend, and he gave a few conflicting accounts to officers. According to Melissa's brother, the boyfriend wanted a serious relationship, but Melissa just wasn't into him like that, or at the very least, she wasn't ready for such a strong commitment so soon, considering she had a son now. She either wanted to break things off or just keep things somewhat casual. According to her brother, the boyfriend wouldn't let this go, and it seems as though he often pressured Melissa into committing, even though she wasn't ready. But when officers spoke with the boyfriend about this, he claimed that the brother was either lying or ignorant to the truth. According to the boyfriend, he agreed with Melissa's decision to take things slow. 
Police weren't buying this at first, so they decided to take a mold of his boots to compare them to the boot prints found at the scene of the crime. Turns out they weren't a match, and police decided to let him go. The following day, investigators called in the help of a detective who specialized in interviewing children. They brought in Melissa's son and spoke with him about what had happened that night, the night that his mother went missing. It turns out the boy, despite being only two years old, was able to reveal a lot of information to the police about the crime. He told investigators that his mother had been attacked by two people. Not only this, but when police asked him what happened to his mom, he grabbed himself by the neck, looked at the detective and said, mommy cried. After hearing this terrifying confession from Melissa's son, the next person of interest was the father of Melissa's son. Just to clarify things here, Melissa's boyfriend, the one that we've been speaking about up to this point, the one that discovered her car, was not the father of her son. The boy's father lived about 80 miles away in Burlington. Police interviewed him, but he had an alibi and was cleared almost immediately. This brought police back to St. Johnsbury. When they made their way into Melissa's home, they searched every square inch of the property, but found no indication of a struggle or anything that was amiss. It seemed as though they'd reached a dead end. But as they looked around, they noticed one small detail that seemed vaguely interesting. A business card for a snow plowing business owned by Alan and Patricia Prue. The police didn't know if this business card was significant, but it seemed as though she'd only recently received the card. So they thought the owners of the business might have some details to share if they happened to be present prior to the crime taking place. By this point in the investigation, police strongly suspected that Melissa had already lost her life. They kept their options open, but they prepared for the worst, as the evidence found at the scene of the crime didn't suggest that the perpetrators intended to keep Melissa alive for very long, and time was running out. Police searched every possible area where someone might have wanted to dispose of incriminating evidence, but they continually turned up empty-handed. They even searched all of the local rest stops and ditches, but there was nothing to be found. It was around the 24-hour mark that investigators received a tip that would blow the case wide open. Someone had called in from a local boat launch and reported that they noticed something suspicious sticking out of the water in a local fishing spot. Investigators didn't think much of it, but they decided to investigate anyway. Once they arrived, they immediately knew that they had encountered a crime scene. As they drew closer to the mysterious object in the water, they found out quite quickly that this wasn't an object. It was a woman, and this woman was none other than Melissa Jenkins. A scuba team was called to the scene of the crime to help collect all of the evidence that may have been left underwater. Mind you, all of this was taking place in the middle of March in Vermont. The waters were borderline freezing temperatures, but the scuba team had a job to do, and they did it well. As they looked under the water, they found that Melissa had been secured in place with a few cinder blocks and rope. Thankfully, they were able to free her without much issue, allowing police to look into the case without too much degradation of evidence. Photos from the scene have been kept under wraps, but officers revealed that Melissa was placed in the water face down. She was then secured with the aforementioned cinder blocks and rope, and was then covered up with sticks and brush to try to conceal her location. But this seems to have been done in a haphazard rush, proving that the criminals weren't prepared for this crime ahead of time. None of Melissa's clothes were found at the scene of the crime, and there was virtually no other evidence to lead investigators to the suspects that may have done this. But when she was pulled from the water, police realized something that shocked them to their core. When police looked into the evidence that was collected directly from Melissa's remains, they found that she was covered in bruises and had several serious wounds that were inflicted immediately prior to her losing her life. These wounds were indicative of a stun gun being repeatedly used, but the next piece of evidence wasn't what officers would have ever expected. They found that someone had taken Melissa's life with their bare hands, an up-close and personal attack that wasn't consistent with the evidence officers had collected up to this point. They believed that they were initially investigating a crime of opportunity, but now they were investigating a crime of passion. When officers began to backtrack Melissa's steps from that day, they first checked her phone records to see who she'd spoken to that evening. They found one call had come in from a prepaid burner phone at around 8.30 that evening. They found that the burner phone had only been used to make this one single call. This led investigators to a store in New Hampshire where the phone had been purchased. 
When they asked the manager about the sale of the phone, they learned that the device had been purchased with a check. The signature on the check tied it to none other than Patricia Prue, the same name that had been printed on the business card that was found inside of Melissa's home. Police planned on calling in the Prues to interrogate them, but as it would turn out, they didn't need to call them, because when they arrived back at the police station, the Prues were there waiting on them. When officers spoke with the couple, Patricia said that she'd come into the police station to report her identity as being stolen, and she believed her ex-husband was behind it. But police quickly turned the conversation to Melissa Jenkins, and the couple both admitted that they had met Melissa before. In fact, they were friends of hers. They'd plowed her driveway a couple times the previous winter, and friends and family of Melissa also said that this was true. They learned that Melissa was very friendly with the Prue couple, but that she hadn't spoken to them in several months. They had been reasonably close friends leading up to this, but according to one of Melissa's friends, Melissa had to end their agreement because she was creeped out by Alan. As it would turn out, Alan Prue had romantic feelings towards Melissa, but these feelings were not mutual. Alan had asked her out on multiple dates, but Melissa repeatedly declined and eventually terminated their business agreement as a result. The Prues were allowed to leave the police station that day, but they were secretly placed under police surveillance over the next few days. Investigators knew that the couple were acting suspicious, and they believed that they may be involved in the crime, but they just didn't have any evidence to prove it just yet. Police eventually managed to retrieve the CCTV footage from the store where the burner phone had been purchased, and as expected, both Alan and Patricia were seen in the footage. During their interrogation with the couple, police noted that Alan mentioned visiting a drive through restaurant that same evening, so they requested footage from the restaurant as well. When the footage finally arrived, investigators were speechless. The CCTV footage showed Alan wearing the same hat that had been found at the scene of the crime that day, the one that had been left in front of Melissa's car. Police called the couple back in for follow-up questions, this time speaking to them separately. Patricia denied any involvement and any knowledge about the crime, even when she was confronted with the CCTV footage and the images from the scene of the crime. Alan, on the other hand, buckled under pressure. Alan opened up to the officers and explained the details of what had taken place that fateful evening, and it wasn't pretty. Police knew that he'd previously shown a romantic interest in Melissa, but they couldn't have expected what he revealed next. Alan admitted that his wife was bisexual. Not only this, but she struggled with monogamy. She would often ask Alan if they could invite other partners into their bedroom, and he felt forced to comply. On this particular occasion, the couple had agreed to find someone willing to come home with them, and Alan specifically wanted to bring Melissa into the equation. The two hatched a plan to fake car troubles, calling Melissa to help them. It seems that the plan was simply to try to seduce Melissa into coming home with them, but the plan went south very quickly. Soon after Melissa arrived, Alan jumped on her and managed to overpower her, but he wasn't able to finish the job. Patricia then jumped in and put an end to things, and the two worked together to stow Melissa in the back of their car, now panicking about what they had done. All the while, Melissa's son watched from the back seat of the car, with both Alan and Patricia blissfully unaware that Melissa had even brought her son with her that evening. The crime wasn't premeditated, so to speak. Yes, they conspired together to try to get Melissa to go home with them, but both Alan and Patricia insist that they had no plans of taking her life that day, and the evidence certainly seems to support this. Alan says that even after things went south, he still had no plans of claiming her life. He admitted to police that he wasn't feeling like himself that night and seems to have been filled with misguided rage, but when he realized what he was doing, he stopped. But that's where Patricia jumped in to finish the job, allegedly against Alan's wishes. During the couple's court proceedings and future interrogations, Alan continually claimed that Patricia was the one to blame for claiming Melissa's life. He admitted to letting his temper get the better of him, and he was willing to accept whatever punishment the court deemed necessary, but he never admitted to taking her life. Regardless, a jury decided that they were both guilty and sentenced each of them to life in prison. Both Patricia and Alan have appealed their sentences since then, but their cries have fallen on deaf ears. In the years since the crime, both Alan and Patricia have continued to blame one another, passing the buck, so to speak. 
The truth is, we don't know which of these two was truly the mastermind behind the crime. All I can say for sure is that, thankfully, it doesn't look like either of these two will ever see the light of day again, and Melissa's family can finally begin their search for closure. Bianca Devins was an up-and-coming Instagram celebrity who gained quite a sizable following online. She made many friends and fans on social media, but one friend in particular seemed to have been much more interested in Bianca than anyone realized. While Bianca and her newfound friend seemingly cared for each other and did everything together, investigators would soon learn that he had an ulterior motive, one that detectives never saw coming and one that would cost Bianca her life and lead to one seriously twisted crime scene. If you're in a relationship with someone, whether you're married or dating, it's best to check in with one another from time to time to make sure everyone's needs are being met, and to be sure that you're on the same page. This is where Paired steps in. Paired is an incredible app that can help you improve communication, stay connected to your partner, and deepen your intimacy as a couple. Most importantly, Paired was designed to help you improve the happiness of your relationships, and it does a wonderful job. You can explore fun games, quizzes, and even receive expert guidance to help strengthen your relationships and overcome your struggles or shortcomings. Paired is a fun and easy way to regain control of your relationships, and it's suitable for all couples in any stage of your relationship. My wife and I have been trying Paired out recently, and I'll admit it's actually quite fun. We've been together for over a decade, but still managed to discover some new things about one another. The games and daily conversations are a welcome change of pace from your typical relationship apps that may seem a bit boring or just plain dull. Paired is truly fun every step of the way, especially the new game called You or Me that was just added to the app. That game in particular is a blast. Click my link below and get 25% off a Paired Premium membership so you can strengthen and deepen your connection with your partner. Thanks to Paired for supporting today's video. Bianca Devins was a self-described fake internet girl who had gathered quite a following on Instagram. But Bianca was also a very real person, something we all may tend to forget from time to time when keeping tabs on some of our favorite social media stars. Bianca seems to have been focused on attempting to make a career out of being a social media influencer, and she was certainly on her way to making these dreams a reality. I can't say for sure just how large of a following that she had, but her account currently sits at just under 150,000 followers, so I'm sure many of these followers found her account after the crime took place, but more on that in just a moment. Being just 17 years old, Bianca had a good head on her shoulders for her age. She was incredibly talented as an artist, and this shows in many of her more expressionistic Instagram posts. Bianca wasn't a so-called e-girl in the traditional sense of the word. Rather than posting provocative photos like many people do these days, she would pose for more artistic shots, often adding in captions or other images alongside herself, making her posts more of a modern art form than anything else. While Bianca focused heavily on her potential career online, she also took the proper steps to ensure that she'd have a successful life in case social media didn't pan out. Bianca was a remarkably bright girl, and her family says that she took pride in her efforts to help others. A former online friend spoke about Bianca and remembered that she always was willing to help those around her, even if she was going through some dark situations in her own life. Bianca had made plans to study psychology at Mohawk Valley College in Utica, New York. She doesn't appear to have decided on what she planned to do with this degree just yet, but I would imagine she would have been involved in counseling or some sort of therapy if I had to guess, but we really don't know for sure. While Bianca presented herself online as a powerful and willful girl, she had some pretty serious struggles that she had to deal with on a daily basis for a number of years. I'm sure most of us are aware that being a teenager is incredibly hard, and many teens end up battling depression at some point. But for Bianca, her struggles were much deeper than anything many of us would have ever had to deal with. Her family spoke about her teenage years and recalled that Bianca had been battling serious bouts of depression for a number of years. Not only this, but she also had to deal with crippling anxiety and a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. 
Now, I don't know really anything about BPD, so I'm certainly not going to try to give any real detail to try to describe the disorder, but I know that a large number of people often struggle with BPD and many of them are teenagers. The only thing I can say for sure about BPD is that it often leads to a disturbingly warped sense of reality and dramatically heightened emotions. And it's been said that up to 10% of people who suffer with BPD will end up taking their own life before finding a suitable form of treatment. If this weren't bad enough, Bianca would also be treated for PTSD, but we don't know for sure what may have led to all these troubles. Bianca's loved ones say that because of all these struggles, she found herself in and out of mental hospitals all throughout her teenage years. Bianca was seriously having a hard time, and she did everything she could to keep her health troubles at bay, but she'd often lose these battles and be forced to spend additional time in various hospitals for treatment. With all of the issues that she faced in her day-to-day -day life, it's no surprise that Bianca found refuge in online communities, particularly 4chan and Discord. And who can blame her? Many of these forums that she became a part of prided themselves on the anonymity that they offered, meaning that Bianca could be whoever she wanted to be without feeling judged for the troubles that she faced on the daily. Bianca found a great number of friends online, but she also made more than a few enemies. According to a newspaper article, while Bianca loved to hide away on the internet, she found herself being harassed by perverted men on multiple occasions, and these men would go to great lengths to lure Bianca and to do well, whatever they wanted her to do. There's really no telling with some of the creeps on the internet these days. They could have been harassing her for photos of her armpits or something for all we know. Now, I say that as a joke, but seriously, if you have teenage kids, keep a close eye on the people that they talk to online. One thing can lead to another very quickly, and Bianca was about to learn this in the worst possible way. One of the men that Bianca had been speaking with online went by the name of Brandon Clark. Brandon was a bit of a troubled child. While details of his childhood and upbringing haven't really been shared publicly, we do know that he had to deal with a lot of trauma in his younger years, much like Bianca. He recalled one particular incident where he witnessed his father using a weapon to hold his mother hostage for several hours. Thankfully, the situation seems to have cleared itself up, but this did a great deal of damage to Brandon considering he was so young at the time. As time passed by, Brandon was able to hold himself together, but he always had troubles and triggers that would send him into fits of rage, paranoia, or worse. While he was able to live a normal life, he'd been battling demons for as long as he could remember, and that's probably why Brandon and Bianca hit it off so well. It's believed by many that Bianca and Brandon met on Instagram sometime in the spring of 2019. He began following Bianca because he enjoyed her posts, but he soon began privately messaging her as well. Bianca thought that he seemed like a perfectly nice guy, so she even messaged him back. Eventually, their relationship blossomed into a real-world friendship, but that's the problem. See, Bianca was just 17 at the time, and Brandon was 21. But this didn't matter to Brandon. While he loved being friends with Bianca, for him, that simply wasn't enough. While their relationship wasn't illegal, per se, considering the age of consent in New York is 17, their relationship certainly turned a few heads. Brandon had expressed his romantic feelings for Bianca several times, but Bianca quickly set him straight, explaining that she wasn't interested in becoming anything more than friends. She felt that the two had a lot in common and they were both able to get a lot out of their friendship, but Brandon just wasn't able to let it go. But here's where things get a bit confusing. According to investigators, they have evidence to suggest that Bianca was, quote, personally intimate with Brandon. Now, your guess is as good as mine as far as what that means, but to me, this suggests that they have reason to believe that the relationship was of a private, consensual nature. I could be wrong about that, but that's the implication as far as I can tell. But Bianca's mother refutes these claims, saying that she'd spoken with Bianca about Brandon on several occasions, and Bianca had assured her that the relationship was nothing more than friendly. But let's be real for a minute. If you were 17 and you were having relations with someone who was 21, would you really tell your parents? Now, I don't know the dynamic of Bianca's relationship with her mother, and I'm certainly not suggesting that Bianca was lying to her mom. I don't know this family at all. The only point I'd like to make here is that it's entirely possible that her mother wasn't aware of the full nature of this relationship. Now, I may seem way out of line to even suggest such a thing, considering Bianca was a minor, but the reason I've come to this conclusion that Bianca wasn't being entirely open with her mother is because one of Bianca's mother's close friends claims that she feared that Brandon was manipulating Bianca. 
The friend claims that Brandon would get Bianca high and then coerce her into sexual encounters. So if this family friend had reason to believe that Bianca and Brandon were intimately involved with one another, and detectives claim the same thing, well, I don't think it would be too much of a stretch to assume that they were intimately involved. But we still need to treat this idea as nothing more than a rumor since it can't be proven. But the real kicker here is that, in all honesty, regardless of the details of Bianca's relationship with Brandon, one thing is certain. She was not interested in him when it came to a serious or even long-term relationship. While they may have been slightly more than friends, she didn't plan on things going any further than that. But Brandon was a very jealous man, and Bianca was a young girl who turned quite a few heads. And unfortunately, this would lead to a dramatic fallout in their relationship and one that Bianca wouldn't recover from. It was July of 2019. Over the last couple of weeks, Bianca had been speaking with her mother about attending a concert in Queens. A gothic folk singer that Bianca was extremely interested in was coming to town and Bianca wanted more than anything to be there. Bianca's mother was extremely nervous about letting her daughter go to a concert unattended, but she soon learned that Brandon would be there as well. Bianca's mother loved Brandon, he seemed like a very clean-cut guy, and she felt much better about letting Bianca go to the concert after learning that he would be going with her. Now, to be clear, her mom still didn't want her to go, but in her mom's own words, Bianca was nearly 18, and she knew that she would go whether she said yes or not. When the night of the concert came, Bianca couldn't contain her excitement. She'd spent the majority of the evening trying on various outfits and asking for her mother's feedback. She finally decided on a black tank top with a black and white skirt. It was around this time that Bianca's mother learned about another person who'd be going with the two to the concert, a young man named Alex that Bianca had met on Discord. We don't know Alex's age, but we know that he lived somewhat close by, and Bianca thought that this concert would be a great way for the two to meet up for the first time. Bianca eventually left home with Brandon and met up with Alex a short while later. According to various reports about the meetup, Bianca appears to have been romantically interested in Alex, even though she had told her mother that she wanted to remain single so that she wouldn't be tied down when she left home to attend college in a few months. But for whatever reason, Bianca appears to have been taken aback by Alex. The two had so much in common, and Alex was an incredibly sweet and caring young man. The two had chatted for hours upon hours online, talking about anything and everything. Bianca felt that the two had been friends for years, even though they'd only known each other for a matter of weeks, as far as I can tell. This relationship only continued and strengthened once they met in person, and Bianca seems to have been falling head over heels for Alex, and the two ended up kissing at a nearby store in Queens. As you could imagine, this kiss angered Brandon greatly. Brandon, being somewhat possessive, felt betrayed by Bianca. After all, she'd no sooner told Brandon that she wasn't interested in anything serious when she, in his eyes, then turned around and began pursuing someone else. Brandon was devastated, to say the least. Bianca insisted to Brandon that this was nothing more than a friendly kiss, but Brandon can sense that something more was going on here. Nevertheless, it appears as though the three attended the concert together anyway, but Brandon kept a much closer eye on Bianca after this. Bianca had been checking in with her mother all throughout the evening, and her final text rang through at about 7.30 p.m. when the three were looking for a parking spot at the show. After this, her mother was left completely in the dark. When her mother hadn't heard back from them by about 1.45 the following morning, she became a bit concerned, but she assumed that Brandon and Bianca had pulled over somewhere to sleep before attempting to drive home after dark. Unfortunately, this wasn't true. By 7 a.m. that morning, Bianca's sister Olivia heard a knock at the door. She answered and was shocked to find that it was the police, and they wanted to talk about Bianca. When prosecutors arrived at Bianca's home, they weren't there because Bianca had gotten into trouble or had been arrested. Instead, they arrived with the worst news a parent could ever imagine. Bianca's life had been stolen from her, and if this weren't bad enough, it was taken by a trusted family friend. While Brandon may have given outward appearances of being a very calm and collected young man, he wasn't, by any stretch of the imagination. The two had argued about Bianca's kiss with Alex for hours after the concert had let out. While Bianca thought it was nothing more than a misunderstanding, Brandon perceived this as a direct violation of his trust, and he wasn't going to stand for it. 
Brandon truly believed that he loved Bianca and he would have done anything to have had her love him back, but if he couldn't have Bianca, no one could. While the two were in the midst of a heated disagreement in Brandon's car, Brandon pulled out a knife that he had hidden in his car earlier and claimed Bianca's life with one swift movement. For reasons that remain unclear, Brandon appears to have been under the assumption or the delusion that he and Bianca were dating, even though she had allegedly made it painfully obvious that she was uninterested. We know that this is the case because Brandon actually called the police himself and confessed to the crime. But rather than admitting that he had taken the life of his closest friend, he phoned 911 and said, quote, I just killed my girlfriend. But here's where things get disturbing, confusing, and just plain dark. On that fateful evening, Brandon revealed that not only was he battling some serious issues, but he was truly a sick and disturbed man. Before he even bothered calling 911, Brandon had actually taken photos with Bianca's body, posed with her body, and then shared these images all over social media. If this weren't bad enough, these photos spread like wildfire, but it gets even worse from here. Considering Bianca was an up-and-coming Instagram celebrity, these photos eventually made their way to Instagram, and soon enough, the photos had been sent to the inboxes of Bianca's family members. These images were sent to Bianca's mother multiple times, with her mother opening the messages before she could realize what they contained, blindsiding her with the most awful images of her child that anyone could ever witness. These images were sent alongside hurtful and untrue statements, with some users claiming that Bianca got what she deserved, with some even saying that Bianca was sleeping around with various people and that she had it coming. But this statement is an outright lie. When detectives dug into the situation further, they learned that Brandon had first posted the images to one of Bianca's regular Discord servers that she was known to frequent. He posted the image alongside an expletive-laced comment saying that her fans would need to find someone else to follow now that Bianca had been dealt with. Detectives have even suggested that Brandon filmed himself committing the crime, and it's rumored that this video is floating around on the internet as well, but to tell you the truth, this isn't an allegation that I'm willing to dig into because some videos are better left unseen. So if you're curious about the validity of these claims, I'll let you do the digging on your own. When police arrived at the scene of the crime following Brandon's phone call and his confession, he turned the weapon on himself and attempted to take his own life, but thankfully first responders were able to administer aid in order to keep him alive long enough to stand trial. In the end, Brandon made a full recovery. Investigators say that they have every reason to believe that not only did Brandon take Bianca's life out of jealousy, but they believe he also did it for the fame, as they found a note left behind at the scene of the crime that was written by Brandon, reading, May you never forget me. Worse yet, the crime may have even been premeditated, and the kiss may not have actually been what provoked Brandon. He may have planned on committing the crime from the very beginning. Police claim that they have more than enough evidence to suggest that Brandon had been planning the crime for quite some time. If you remember, the weapon that Brandon had used to commit the crime had been stashed away in his car ahead of time, presumably long before Bianca's kiss with Alex. Brandon had also spent several days googling information about the location of the carotid artery online, as well as how to incapacitate someone. By all means, it seems as though Brandon had every intention of claiming Bianca's life for weeks in advance, but in the end, he was only sentenced to prison for second-degree murder, presumably due to a lack of irrefutable evidence. But thankfully, Brandon was given life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. But if we're being honest, I think we all know that this man will never see the light of day again. In the aftermath of the crime, Bianca's crime scene photos were popping up all over the internet. Her family were forced to not only live through the tragic and heartbreaking loss of their loved one, but every time they opened social media, they were greeted with more disturbing images of their family member. One of Bianca's friends recalled a time when someone had forwarded the photo to her. The friend had flagged the photo and reported it to Instagram so that it could get removed. But get this, she got a message back from Instagram the following morning saying that the image didn't violate their terms of service, and thus it wouldn't be taken down. This happened on more than one occasion as well. Some of Bianca's family members said that they continued to receive these images in their inboxes for more than two years after Bianca had lost her life. With her family essentially being unable to do anything to drown out these disturbing photos, fans of Bianca came up with a different idea. Her followers all worked together to begin sharing photos of pink clouds in Bianca's honor. 
The idea here seems to have been to snuff out the images of Bianca's crime scene with images of peaceful pink clouds, and this movement certainly works to a certain extent. For Bianca's family, though, the damage had already been done. Bianca's mother says that she doesn't feel as though she can close her eyes without seeing the awful, disgusting final images of her daughter. Worse yet, she found out that the Oneida District Attorney's Office also leaked private images and videos of Bianca to the press. So now these videos are circulating around on the internet as well. These images supposedly came from Bianca's private phone, and when investigators and detectives searched the phone during the investigation, these images were uploaded to a database shared by multiple law agencies, then eventually leaked to the public somehow. Without getting into too much detail, all I can really say is that these photos and videos, well, they're disturbing and highly illegal, as Bianca was underage. That should tell you all that you need to know. Bianca's family has since pressed charges, but as of now, the case hasn't been settled. This story is just disgusting from beginning to end. From Bianca's mental health issues, to the actions of her close friend, to the mishandling of her case by the district attorney's office, everything about this case is just tragic. Bianca's family will still be battling court cases for many years to come, but maybe on some level, the incarceration of Brandon will help bring them some form of peace, knowing that the man that ruined their lives will now be locked away forever. At trial, Brandon certainly did show signs of remorse, but whether these feelings were genuine or all for show remains to be seen. All we can hope for now is that Brandon never gets to live his life in the free world ever again. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. I wanted to give a special thank you to a couple channel members, including Sabrina Toner and April Howard. If you also want to become a member of the channel, you can gain access to new videos sometimes days or weeks before they're uploaded to the public, and it's currently the best way you can support the channel and help out. I really appreciate those of you who have decided to do that. If you want to join, you can click that big join button below the video or find the link in the description. This is a case that has rolled around in my mind for a number of years now. I actually covered Patrick's case about three years ago, and it's certainly one I never forgot. How a kid can just vanish like this, it's, it's truly beyond explanation. When you toss in all of the other strange details and witness testimony, well, none of it even makes sense. My heart genuinely goes out to the Betts family, because I felt for sure that this case would be solved relatively quickly when I covered it all those years ago, and it blew my mind to see that there were still virtually no updates after all this time. I know a lot of you guys don't care for the unsolved cases, but unsolved cases are just as important as the solved ones, if not more so. But as always, if you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.